Casey. Yes, sir. Is it game time? It's game time. Yes, sir. Welcome to Hood Stocks on a Sunday evening. It feels good. It feels good. I don't know about you guys, man, but about two o'clock in the morning, man, it was raining cats and dogs. Man, it was coming down. I think I might have some grass coming up in my backyard pretty soon. <laughs> hey, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. I love you guys, man. Thank you for joining us this evening. Let's go. Cypress Hill, man. Remember, I had that cassette tape. I used to be in my cell, plugging my nose, singing along with him. Shout out to Be Real from Cypress Hill. Let's pay some bills right here. All right. Hey, looking for some good quality cannabis? I mean, killer quality cannabis. Hit up the folks at Killer Coots. They specialize in bringing you the best quality available from OJ to Exotic. They got... Uh, Oh, baby. <laughs> yes, hit them up at KillerCushCali at gmail.com or follow them on, on IG at KillerCush underscore underscore 420. Matter of fact, I got a location for you right now. Pull up in the city of Whittier at True Organics and the address to that is 13739 Leffingwell Road. Yes, sir. I want to give a big shout out to Stizzy. Stizzy is a big dog sponsor of this podca podcast. <laughs> Pull up to the local Stizzy shop in here and cop some of that bomb bomb. You can follow them on Instagram at Stizzy. Shout out to Leanne. Love you, girl. Uh, for all you fat fuckers out there trying to lose major weight or even you IG model strippers trying to lose, you know, a little bit, you know, maybe 10 pounds, tighten up that booty, um, hit up my boy uh, Vince at LA Peptides. LA Peptides, excuse me. They got everything you need to lose weight and feel great. They have Ozempic, Mujaro, and even newer and better. They also have tanning peptides. I mean, what do you mean? You don't got to go outside in the sun to get a tan? This is ridiculous, you know? What? But hey, we, huh, yeah, we are moving into the space age of uh, <laughs> pharmaceuticals and all this other stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, just, just you slam some of this insulin in your belly and pop up, you know, you lose weight. Oprah Winfrey, all the famous people, man, that's how they losing their weight. Uh, this stuff right here, this this is the plug right here. This is the backyard boogie plug, right? You ain't gotta go spend thousands of dollars through the pharmacy and know somebody. Here it is right here. Matter of fact, I'm gonna give you his phone number, 714-269-1900. Holler at my, vo my boy Vince right here. Hey, did I leave out that they have horny peptides too? No bullshit, no joke. For men and women, capture that old school sex drive. Here's the number again, 714-269-1900 or check them out on IG at LA Peptides. Looking for the best criminal offense attorney in the city of Los Angeles. Look no further. Uh uh. Doug Sherrod is our guy and he can be your guy as well. Mr. Sherrod used to be a federal prosecutor as well as a district attorney for the city of Los Angeles. He didn't like the unfair politics on that side of the fence, so now he's going to bat for individuals that have been wrongfully accused or just had a bad weekend, right? Don't have a bad weekend. This is 2024. And you know what? Hey, I don't want you to have to call Doug Sherrod, but if you have to, he's the best in the game. But if you stay on the right side of the fence, you know what I mean? Bop, bop, bop. You know, two hands on the steering wheel, you're going to be all right. But if you need the dude right here, his name is Doug Sherrod and you can reach him at Casey King Kong Lawyer dot com Droopy King Kong Lawyer dot com King Kong Lawyer dot com Orange County stand the fuck up Wolf Gutter Phenom is a lifestyle brand that's dedicated to supporting individuals who determined their who, who are determined to achieve their dreams we believe that no matter where you come from and what you've been through with hard work and dedication anything is possible a portion of our proceeds are donated to organizations that provide vocational training for proleys and scholarships to those in need of drug and alcohol treatment Jesus that's what I was gonna say hey peep game visit gutterphenom.com Casey gutterphenom.com and use the exclusive code hoodstock20 to receive 20% off your order today. Gutterfeedom.com. All right, guys. Whew, let's go, man. This shit has been in the works for uh, 
I think I've been talking to this gentleman right here for over a year, over a year. And you know, you sometimes you just got to be patient. You got to be patient. And when they ready, they're going to holler at you. And if they ain't ever ready, they're not going to holler at you. Hey, you might recognize this uh, evening's guest from Netflix series, The Innocent Files. You might recognize this guest from doing time in the California state prison system. You might recognize this guest living his best life on these L.A. streets, blessed with a beautiful family, educated, standing on the biggest political stages, rubbing shoulders with big dogs, trying to make a change within our community. Everyone, give a warm welcome for Frankie Carrillo. Let's go. <laughs> Frankie, thank you, and I appreciate you for making time, brother. Thanks for having me. Like it's been it's been a long time coming, man. I'm, I'm glad I'm finally here. I mean, I get it, bro. I get it. Uh, a, a man of your stature, where you come from, and where you're at now. Um, sometimes you can pro- it can probably. How you you think about risk and reward on maybe coming on a platform like this? Let's be real about it. You know, I mean, I'm no fucking idiot, and sometimes I'm acting like an idiot, but maybe I'm just having fun. You know, a little too much fun, right? Um, but I get it, brother. I get it, and um, I'm just I'm thankful, very thankful that you. F- it finally made sense for you to come on Hoodstocks. You know, I don't know what your thought process was behind behind it. I think about it. I think about people like yourself and what their process, their thought process is coming on Hoodstocks. You know, and I think about risk and reward, you know? But anyways, you're here, Frankie Carrillo, baby, man. Um, h- how's your day been? It's been good, man. It's been, uh, started off cold, like everybody else is here in LA, man, but uh, it's warmed up. All those rumors, uh, this, this uh, space is a little chilly in here, man, I gotta it, say. It is, it is. And, and you know <laughs> what? By design, a, right? Just it, Well, you know, sometimes we gotta turn the AC up right here because, you know, it's uh, sometimes there's a little bit of a powwow going on here. Some It's, it's a men's locker room, you know, right. so, uh, you know, a lot of body heat, you know, so I, I'd rather have it a little bit chilly than uh, musty, right? I'm with you, I'm with you. Yeah, 100%, brother. Um, I got, I got, before we get into your story, brother, I have two questions that I wanna ask you. Are you familiar with the Justice 8, what's going on with Alex Enamorado? Are, are you familiar with that? I am. What are your thoughts behind that? You know, it, it, it sounds like a classic witch hunt. It sounds like, you know, here's some folks who are, you know, making some noise, representing people who, in, in many cases, don't have a voice. You know, the work that he's doing, you know, I'll, I'll maybe focus on him versus all the other seven. Uh, you know, he's been on your show and I, you know, I follow him on um, Instagram. But it's unfortunate. You know, it's another county. Obviously, some counties have other policies, but I just wonder. Uh, what's going to happen next? I know one of your attorney buddies is on the case, and so... Yeah, uh, uh, Rosenberg. Yep. Yeah, Rosenberg. And I think, you know what, I think uh, Rosenberg is like a perfect... I, hopefully, I hope he does Justice 8 justice, right? Or Alex justice. I think he's representing just Alex, and there's other attorneys involved, which could potentially make a super team of different attorneys, right? You know, they can all help each other out because it's the same case, same charges, right? But Alex is the ringleader. And shout out to Alex. You know what? I don't see eye to eye on him with politics, but I love his passion and his drive. But I, you know, and and I said it on Instagram, that I told the guys like a year ago, like, you know, one day the hoodas are gonna come for this dude. The, the cops are gonna come for him, you know? Just like any organization, um, you bang hard enough on their door, one day they will answer it in a way that you may not like, you know? And and and, and that's just reality of life, right? right. It's reality of life, but... Uh, I, I just I was wondering if you followed that and you know and it, you basically said what everyone else has been saying. Yeah, uh, you know, which I, I don't chime in, bro. I don't chime in on you know the comments, but you know when I see somebody who's who's advocating for a community that you know in many cases have either been victimized or need folks to support them and back them up, for him to be then ridiculed and you know at this point now even brought up on charges, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's been a long time coming, but but. For me today to say, uh, let's hope justice prevails is all we can sort of like lean on and hold hold on to and say that, you know, let's uh, let's see it play out, you know. And I hope he, he gets um, he gets what he has coming, which is which is a just process, a fair process. A hundred percent. The no bail is crazy, huh? I think that's uh, you know I'm not even sure if that's a, a statewide policy. I kind of should should have uh, been aware of that, but I know the case is in Riverside, right? 
I believe so, yeah. yeah. Yep, I think it's... Uh, Victorville, I believe. I don't Victorville. know what county that... Yeah. Can Maybe. you talk a little more on the mic, brother? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, brother. Set up a little bit more. Yeah, I know that chair is. Yeah, you know, for, you know, I'm not, an attorney, I'm not an attorney, bro. So I don't, you know, I don't want to give any kind of legal advice. No. Other than to say, as someone who's like, uh, you know, watching from the from the sidelines, like we all are, you know, I want to I want to make sure that people who are paying attention, you know, uh, as I am, I guess, I'm, you know, I'm going to have faith that this is all going to work out for him. I, I know it's going to work you know. out for him. I know it's going to work out for him. Why? Because he, he's he's not a bad guy. He's not a bad guy. Even though there are good people that bad things happen to, and just like yourself, mm -hmm. right? You know. Um, and I wanted to ask you another question that just came up right before we went live. You were taught you. I had no idea that Central <laughs> Juvenile Hall is closed down, which I've been in and out of that multiple times yep. as a juvenile, and you made that happen. You know, for the last, I think it's the last three years now, I was appointed to be a county commissioner. So it's the first in, its, in the country, it's the Probation Oversight Commission. So it's a, a body of individuals, and in this commission, there's nine of us, and there's a you know, team behind you know, the executive director and so on. And, you know, the conditions of confinement here in the county for, for juveniles in the system has been horrific, you know. Um, not, only, not only the treatment, but also just just things that are going on, on the inside, right? So, you know, Central Juvenile Hall has been around for almost 100 years. Has it been around that long? Damn, I think from the 20s, actually. So wow. maybe a little bit over 20, you know, 100 years. <sighs> and so, that. you know, there's there's a, there's Silmore Juvenile Hall, uh, Barry J. Nordoff, uh, Los Padrinos, and Downey, and Central. And the reality was that there was about, you know, maximum maybe 100, give or take, in each institution. So, you know, the idea is to consolidate, if, you know, if you're going to have kids who are going to be locked up, why do you have, you know, a couple in Central, a couple in Silmar? And so, long story short, they shut it down. You know, we, we worked really hard to make that happen, and so I'm really grateful that it's no longer an institution that's holding young bodies. So what is the difference in regards to, I mean, what is the ideal way to house juvenile offenders, Right. What is that? What is like, how do you see they should be housed being the fact that once upon a time ago you were there? And so what would be the proper way of housing juvenile offenders and why just Central and not Los Padrinos, not Silmar, you know, mm -hmm. because the, it's basically the same thing. You know, it's a great question, Lucky. I, you know what? What's where we're moving now as, as a county is to say, you know, use your reference about the bail. Right. With, uh, with Alex. Alex. Is that these young these youngsters, you know, obviously under eighteen years old, awaiting some deposition from their case? The movement is that this should be assessed and um, processed and be allowed to go through the process from the outside. So there's there, you know, I believe in that. If there's some cases that that require some some you know their body being held confined during their trials or during their you know whatever proceedings, that's one thing. But the majority of them should definitely have a chance to um, fight their cases from the outside. And so there's, there's a number of things. Some cases, you know, the family member will allow them to stay with them. Um, there are some situations where they can be at a, you know, not an institution, but they can be like at a, um, you know, a safe home, almost like a foster care home. Yeah. Um, but the reality is that th that's a great question. You know, there is no reason why the majority of these kids were there for a number of reasons. Um, now I can give you an example in a minute, need to be confined. Um, and instead they can just be cited, you know, uh, go through the, the paperwork, get, get their motion, get the case, you know, um, um, situated. May that be just sort of like you're on the, you're on the other calendar to go to court and so on and do that from home. You don't have to be in, in LP anymore. Mm. In some cases you, that happens all the time. It happens all the time, depending on, you know, what the circumstances are with a good lawyer or, your family's advocating for you. And sadly, there are still some families who think that taking their kid to Los Padrinos for a weekend to scare them is what's gonna get them going on the right track and, you know. Little do they know, it, uh, I'd say eight times out of 10, it, it really doesn't, like the scared straight tactic, right? Doesn't work. Backfires, bro. Yeah. Dude, I did a pro violation one time in Chuckawalla when Chuckawalla was a, a, a good prison to do a pro violation at. Um, <laughs> not that any prison is a good, but I'm just saying in regards to the where it stands right now in the present time, um, they had 
they had this scared straight program. And I was invited to go out to the visiting room because they brought, uh, I don't know where these kids came from, but I think they were at risk youth, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. they weren't straight A students. I mean, why would you take straight A students to a prison yard, right? So I think they were little bad motherfuckers, right? And dude, I watched, I was in the room and I said, I'll check it out, I'll check it out. And so I watched from the sideline while these guys, most of them uh, pro violators, you know, convicts, and they were doing that scared straight shit with them in mm. their face. Mm. And you know what? I knew even back then, this is like many years ago, brother. I knew back then, I said, this is the wrong way to go about this. Dude, half those kids, half those, man, you should have seen the, the, the smirks or the, mm. the, 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 the smirks on some of these kids' face. They were just like turning to the side like, mom, like, shh. Like, like they already, like they were pissed. They weren't happy about this grown dude all tatted up. You want to get raped in jail? You want to do this? You want to like? You, they, they weren't happy about that. And you know what? I'll tell you this, Frankie. I felt embarrassed. I felt embarrassed. I said, "What the fuck are these dudes doing all up in the dash?" Yeah. You know, and so, I'm, no, I'm with you, but no, I'm, I'm just having some flashbacks when I was at Folsom and that same program was there. They called it um, had a different name to it, but it was basically the same thing. Uh, youth diversion program is what they called it at Folsom. And, you know, the, 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 the guys who were brought in to be participants of that program had different methods. Some had more old school way of talking to the kids. Other guys had a more, you know, philosophical or psychological approach. But at the end of the day, I think for the kids, it was like, look, you're, you're looking at this with your own eyes. You're in the prison. Look around. Do you want to end up here? Yeah. Let that let that sink in versus all the screaming and you know I'm gonna rape you if you get here like but that that's not language that I would I would ever use but you know guys think that's what they have to say to scare these kids and you know you know what I think would be a good method is no talking at all all right all right so you guys want to bring these at risk kids to a prison environment a prison setting so they can see it and instead of he them hearing it let them feel it. Mm. Hey, all right, we're going to leave you in the cell, and we'll be back in eight hours. Mm. Let him see it, no, right? Think. Give him a sack lunch. Give him a sack <laughs> lunch. Give one of those good sack lunches. I mean, you know, we'll be back in eight hours. Yeah. Oh, they wouldn't be, they couldn't wait to get out there. You that. know, one, one of your partners here was talking about the box at Central. Yeah, So when the I was there in 91, um, you know, for a number of reasons, I'm in the box, you know, and they just called it the box, and it was like a, you know, dungeon from back in the day. And, you know, they had it. What I remember the most was it was like this, you know, Oliver Twist, this little metal bed springs, and the heater was in the, in the, in the cement. It was like, a, I'm not sure, you know, what design that was, but the, the room was really hot, and it was coming from the floor. And not only was it like you were confined, but like your senses were being fucked with, man, you know? And it was like one of those moments where, you know, Looking back now, was it designed to really like torture you on every possible way? You're in the small little box. The room is super hot. The bed is, you know, uncomfortable. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, these are adults who are, con who, are con who are architects who are designing these, these jails. And, you know, I wonder to what degree are people, you know, um, their biases when they design these little jail cells for these kids. Cause it's a, it was a juvenile from the gate. So... They knew who was going to be in these little rooms. Um, but, you know, not to be, you know. What was their thought behind it? What was your thought behind it? Okay, you're designing this to put a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old. Shit, in some cases, you see some kids like nine years old in there. You know? You're designing this to put a nine-year-old, and you put them in there, heated room, and what do they do? They just give you a Bible. I've been in the box, Central Juvenile Hall, mm -hmm. give you a Bible. And I mean, I am the only one that went to the box in Central Juvenile Hall when I was there for jacking off. I just couldn't stop jacking <laughs> off. You know what I mean? Because the methamphetamine <laughs> didn't wear off until a week later. So I was just like, gah, 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 gah. And he said, man, so you got to stop doing it. I couldn't stop. No, I'm just sorry. <laughs> I told you we're going to have a good podcast, bro. I told you, I, <laughs> I told you I'd leave that shit out, bro. No, I'll just fuck with you, Frankie. I had to get one in, Frankie. Oh, jack <laughs> hammer hands. Jack hammer Yeah, I'm, I'm on. Hey. Anyways. Um, no, 100%. I, 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 I agree, Frankie. Um, so here we are, man. I've, everyone has seen you. A lot of people have seen you on the Netflix series Innocent Files, the Innocent Files, bro. And um, what struck me 
with the beginning of your story, um, I think it was one of the, probably the first episode. There's two episodes on there if you guys want to look it up after the podcast, man. It's who it's great. It's actually it's a little bit of a tearjerker, man. You know what I mean? If you really uh, been there and done that, you know what I mean? You can really feel it, you know. But if you haven't, you I believe you still will feel it. Um, and uh, what what was when you first went in? I mean, your 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 mom had left you, had left your father, so your father was just raising you. You know, it was it was a broken family, bro. You know, mom and dad divorced. But usually, pops leaves. You know, traditionally in the, in, the, in a Mexican family, the dad cuts out, right? Dad's missing, mother's raising the children. But in this case, you know, um, just wasn't the case, right? So dad dad was raising four children, two sisters, my two older sisters, and myself and my little brother. And um, and mom was gone. You know, mom was was um, doing her own thing. You know. Was she younger and Pops was older? She was. You know, my dad, you know, it's it's uh, it's one of those, uh, you know, I was 20 years difference, bro. There's no way of, you know, tippy-toeing around that. So dad was a, was a, was 20 years older than my mother. Okay. They were married in Mexico and eventually moved to the U.S. You know, they got here in the late 60s, the East L.A. And, um, you know, set up shop. You know, they were, they were basically from Tijuana, so not too far from home. And they're now here in LA and had a bunch of family, had, you know, uncles and aunts, on, um, mainly my father's side who were here and a lot of friends. So they had a community here that was awaiting them. And, you know, obviously that grew. Um, but when it came to just uh, the marital dynamics, it just didn't work out. Mm. Especially when they got over here. Yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've spent some time, you know, obviously trying to dissect that story. And Is it hard to, for you to speak on it? Because you probably have better, you have, do you have, obviously have a relation with moms now? You know, I do. You know, my, my dad passed away during my incarceration. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I enjoy talking about it. I don't, I, huh. I, I think now I try to be more understanding. I think before there was a time where I was more, um, you know, speaking from like an emotional point of view. Like I was the, the nine, the nine year old boy who's, who still needed the mother's nurture, nurturing, um, cooking, you know, whatever, uh, all the things a mother brings, which is a lot, as we know, right? Do you think it's more important than a father's? I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think it's a good question. Do you think a, a mother's nurture is more important than a father's if, you know, in some situations there's only one or the other, you can only have one or the other? You know, bro, I'm grateful that my story is my, my dad was around. Let's you know, go. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it would be ideal if both parents were there, at least if, even if they weren't together, they were like involved. Which is, which is, you know, second best, right? Yeah. But when, when one of the parents is totally checked out and you don't see them for years, you know, after the fact, then you're kind of wondering what's going on. Because then you get, like, you're in a, you're in a Chicano neighborhood and, you know, people are asking you, where's your mom? And you got to be, you know, get into a fight over that or you don't, you know, you're lying about where your mom is and, you know, it's all that kind of noise that's unnecessary, but you got to, you got to put up with it, you know? Kids are cruel, man. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but um, you know, Mom, pops, especially mama jokes. <laughs> oh yeah, you know it's 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 a trip, man. I remember, um, you know, I'm in I'm deep, you know, a decade plus in the joint, and you know, d people would hear about my story. You know, I would share them with the Sally or something, right? And they would say like, "Man, I wonder what your mom is feeling right now, man." You know, like you know, all oh, you've gone through, like the mom, like the mom gets a lot of like, sh she's like the sounding board for like the tragedy in someone's life. Like your mom was, must be really going through it. Your mom must be really sad. Your mom must be really um, brokenhearted. And I'm sure my mom was through all that, you know, but because there was a, they didn't know the real story or the backstory, I was always left with just like, yeah, yeah, she's, she's, she's up, you know, she's broken up over it. She's, a, she's sad, because I'm sure she is. But because there was this uh, a broken family that cracked in a way that was kind of hard to even talk about. It, I'm sure it would have been a lot easier if I would have said my dad and mom broke up and my dad left. And then, like, everyone can kind of understand yeah. what happens next. But, yeah. you know, but it was cool about the story, man, is that um, is that dad was like, you know, he just picked the pieces and, you know, you know, by example, you know, showed us how to sweep and mop and cook and peel those potatoes and, and do stuff that typically maybe he wasn't used to himself. But um, we were we were trying to put a family together, and you know he never remarried, so it was just strictly pops. You know what? I just want to give a big shout out to pops, R.I.P. Frankie Senior, correct? Yep. Francisco. That's right. Yeah, salute to that man, R.I.P. to him, and you know my like condolences. I know that happened many years ago, <clears> but still, I want to show my respect, brother. Um, growing up in Linwood, man, 
Linwood, That's baby, good. back then, back in back in your day, man, it was a, it was probably a different Linwood than it is now. Probably safe to say a little bit, huh? Yeah, I think so, bro. I, th- I think Linwood. You know, I experienced white flight, so I was born in '74. So when I was in the early '80s, I had you know African American neighbors and white neighbors, and mainly mainly black, white, and brown. And then at some point, um, Asians start moving in. I think like uh, Vietnamese or, or um, Laos or somebody start moving in. But I think early on. To start witnessing your white neighbors leave by the groves and, and, and just move away. You know, just, you know, Paul and Mark who live right next door. Yeah. And Amy and, and Fucking Darren. Jeremy. They're just gone, dude. Yeah. You know, they're just, they're just like no longer around, you know. And, um, you know, nobody was telling you. You didn't get the memo. Your, your parents didn't get the memo about, like, it's time yeah. for you to bounce, you know. Yeah. So, um, but we made the best of it. Like, you know, I, I enjoyed my time in Linwood growing up. It was still a... Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting to think about Linwood now, obviously after the fact, but it was a, it was a, a, a repurposed town, man. There was still these old like diners and bowling alleys and and um, shuffleboard in the park. You know, Relics. things that, yeah, things that you yeah. know. I, I mean, I never played shuffleboard, but it was you, you know, you walk right by it and wonder yeah. what that game was about. You know, or, see all the old timers out there. Yeah, you know, it was it was almost like a very white town that you know became very black and brown. And and that was around. That sort of happened. What around the like eighties, nineties? More like early eighties, early eighties, mid eighties. Yeah, and, and I'm sure it had been happening prior to that. But you know, I just yeah. I think you know you start hearing you know terms about white flight, and then you start remembering. Oh, you know what that? I remember that um so and so was you know and you know all these kids that I grew up with who were just majority white boys, and girls were just leaving, and so. Um, then you understand that, you know, some of the factories are shutting down, you know, Firestone and Chevy were like, you know, big factories are bringing in a lot of dough, you know, providing a lot of a lot of jobs. And so folks were just you know, either following the company to another state or just leaving the area just because they kind of saw the writing on the walls, possibly. Hmm. That's interesting, man. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. Now we have this. uh now they're coming back with this. Well, they've been back. You know, no, I mean, I don't want to say it like that, but gentrification, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Um, it just <laughs> the way history kind of just uh, uh, repeats itself a little bit. You know, um, you know, they leave and now uh, come back. Anyways, um, so growing up in Linwood, it seemed like you were, you know, from the Netflix series Innoc- The Innocent Files. It seems like you were just like, yeah, you had friends. They were from the neighborhood, so automatically, and you had a, a family that was from young crowd, mm-hmm. uh, sisters, husband, b- boyfriend. The neighborhood was was entrenched in the family. You know, okay, there was there was a, a lot of overlap in many different ways, and you know, but um, overall, you know, it's one of those it's one of those cities where if you live in a certain geographical part of the city, you were by default anyone from the out that's sort of like in the other side of town just assumed you're from the neighborhood. And so, you know, you just kind of just fell into that mindset of like, you know, if someone's going to hit you up or if they don't, um, they just assume you're, you're, you're running with the crowd, you know. And so, you know, this is this is now like, here, I'll give you a good example, bro. So when I was, when I was um, maybe even in elementary school in Linwood at the time, so this is like, I don't know, 84, 85, a lot of the guys who were, like like the local heroes, the guys who had the, the nice cars, the guy coming back from war or from the military at least, um, so and so's uncle, you know, just you, you get to know all the players in the neighborhood, and they were just guys that you just thought were just like a little bit older than you, or just like the the adults, and then you realize that there was an actual neighborhood that there was a they called themselves something, you know, or there was a there was a group, whatever, yeah, the gang, local gang. And what I realized was that in this specific part of Linwood, like everyone was like family. Everyone knew each other. I would say 99%, bro. Like everyone was like the mothers knew everybody, the grandmas, and it was really close. So you almost saw it as more like a family or just like by default, you're just kind of interacting with each other. And I remember uh, the summer between the sixth grade and the seventh grade, so elementary school and junior high school back. They rallied all the little troops, all the guys who were going to be the newbies to uh, to the ju- to the juvenile to the uh, Hoster Juvenile Hall, uh, Hoster uh, Junior High School, the Junior High School, and so all the kids. It was about I don't know fifteen new new little heads who were going to be going to the Junior High School, and the guys, the seventh, uh, the eighth graders, the guys who had been there one year prior, 
wanted to run us down what was going to go what was going to happen and i remember we all got together at someone's pad and these are guys we knew so these are guys we rode bikes with and you know exchange when parts with whatever right so we knew these guys but it was basically the message was like look um Hofstra Junior High School is basically in the enemy's territory. Like it or not, you can you can say, you know, you're not from the crowd. You can say whatever you're going to say. They're going to be like, yeah, right. And they said, just so you can see, tomorrow, which is the first day of school, let's all meet up right here, and we can all go to school together and watch what's going to happen. So I'm freaked out, dude. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a youngster, man. I'm not, you know... I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to school. It's junior high school. So we all show up and we all walk to school. And sure enough, it seemed like the entire school was waiting for us. We walk in and there was a full-on riot, like, I don't know, 30 seconds as we walked in. Every, every, uh, every, it seemed like every, everybody. It seemed like even the staff, the teachers, everybody was just like awaiting us, you know. And it was a rude awakening because I felt like we had finally, at least I had finally like left my, my bubble of like, the neighborhood and sort of ventured out now for school for junior high school and um and it turns out that's just what was happening like that was new to me but that's just what had happened you know the year prior the year prior to that and you know it was these invisible lines that you know many folks um, like myself was being made aware of and so you know life kind of went from there yeah and um when we talk about life going from there uh with you I mean, it it, it's, it turned into a nightmare. It turned into a nightmare. You got a uh, Netflix special tells you it shows that you're uh, you're sleeping on the sofa. You're getting the door pounded on. Yep. It's a sheriff's. So you had no idea they were there for you. Yep. You know, you open the door. They run in there. They have you and your pops on the floor. It seemed like you told your pops. What did you tell your pops? Hey, they're not here for me. You know, my dad's looking. You know, we're it's a we're on a cement floor basically, and pops is you know cheek to cheek, kind of like on the ground. He's we're looking at each other sideways there, and he's like, "What happened? What's going on?" You know, it's, you know, we're being you know brutally awakened, right? And so I'm like, I don't know, like I didn't, I didn't do anything, and so he's asking me to ask the cops, you know, what what they want and so on, and you know, he eventually starts saying, speaking some English as well. He, he had enough English under his belt, but they were just ignoring us, you know. And, um, you know, it turns out it turns out that there was a crime that was committed six days prior to my arrest where an innocent bystander, Donald Sarpy, a 42-year-old father, had been gunned down in the drive-by. And the, the, there, there was a star witness who was telling the, the sheriff deputies that it was me who did it. And so that's, you know, that's what I learned soon after I got to the, to the substation in Linwood, you know, when I was being, being arrested. What kind of kid were you up until this point? You know, what you you uh, past uh, year. I mean, obviously, you were you started circulating around the neighborhood. You were seen with certain individuals. The cops had a picture of you that you hung out. You've been you had a uh, uh, police uh, interactions. Were you pulled over? A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. You know. I think I think what was going on, and I think it's safe to say that you know the, the Netflix series also talks about that this was uh, this was not only a, a na- neighborhood that had um, you know, heavy gang influence or you know a, a number of things going against it, but what was the worst was that the local sheriff's department had turned rogue, so they had become a gang of themselves called the Linwood Vikings. So the Linwood Vikings were the deputies who were not only patrolling the streets but writing police reports and going to court testifying so they had they were working the system from both sides and so you know my 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 involvement um how that how that how that how my photograph i'll I'll make it more specific they used a picture of me for this photo lineup and the picture they used was one that was collected like a year and a half prior on a random day in linwood you know cop pulls up sheriff deputy pulls up and says you know we're on our bikes and he stops, we stop, and he starts talking about, you know, what school do you go to? You got a girlfriend, everyone's laughing, just just shooting the shit. No one's taking it serious, no one's done anything wrong. And then the guy says, Do you mind if I take your photograph? And back then it was the Polaroid, so you know, 
I, I remember they'd been 13, 14. So I'm like, yeah, sure, I guess. Nobody disagreed. And so right where we were at, he just took a photograph of us. And so that random picture was used in this photo lineup, you know, whatever, a year and a half, two years later. But I, th I think at the core of it, you know, it was his mindset that, you know, he's, uh, he's been identified as a murderer, um, as, as a shooter in this, in this crime, and we got him. And my, my little 16-year-old body or my voice trying to defend myself could not, could not even compete with that. They were, they, were, they were set that I was a person who did it, and I was on my way to LP. Why would a police department, you already have a badge on your chest, you already represent, you know, you already represent authority within a community, right? You know, why would a police department have to create an inner gang within an, a, a very powerful organization? I mean, why would, why would police officers want to do that or decide to do that. I mean, obviously you've thought about that, right? Like, why do they do that? Because I believe that still is happening to this day. Maybe it's I hear still going on. Yeah, it's still going on. You know, I'll, I'm sure. I'm sure someone has has used, you know, very parallel lines about why people either join gangs or where gangs originate from. I'm sure they use that same language to define, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. But I think you're right. I think that. You know, these are these are individuals who are applying for a job once upon a time, and they got the job, and they got trained, and and they, you know, got the badge, got the gun, and they got the assignment. And I think, like like most, maybe more men than women, but I think maybe overall, I shouldn't make this a gender issue. You know, once you start grouping up, and you're on a specific shift, or you're on a specific yard, you're on a specific team, you're on a specific, you believe, which, you know, you might all go for the Raiders or whatever, you start having that herd mentality or that gang mentality, and you start doing things that, as they were doing that were beyond um, why they were hired. So I think once you're, once you're, you know, I mean, especially law enforcement, I mean, it goes without saying, right? If you're, if you're a cop and you're doing things that has, I think historically we hear about, you know, planning evidence, falsifying reports, stealing money, killing people, like there's a, a, a laundry list of things that a cop shouldn't be doing. And the fact that they have taken it one step further and have called themselves something. The Vikings. The, there's the Vikings, the Banditos, there's, there's a number of different ones, you know, so. I just don't understand the benefit of it, you know, it, the, that it's a very malicious, it's very, um, I just, I, I don't, I have a hard time understanding the benefit of why somebody would do that. It's, obviously, it's an abuse of power. You know, maybe one day I saw Frankie walking down the street and he was giving me all five middle fingers, so to speak, right? Mm. You know, and it's like, nah, fuck him, you know what I mean? But he's a kid, right? He's a kid, but why would I want to? I mean, when it, when it came down to you getting picked out in this lineup, and it seems like the, it seems like, Watching this Netflix special, it seems like the, the person that pointed you out was kind of like, uh, what is the word, Cohor co coerced. Co coerced. Yeah. coerced, yeah. In, into it, like, I mean, why would they want to go after a 16-year-old kid named Frankie, you know what I mean? You know, did you have any bad blood? I mean, you said they took a Kodak picture one time. You guys were laughing around. You're like, all right, fuck it. I mean, you're a kid. You ain't going to tell the cop no. He's like, that the dude is God in the neighborhood, the yeah. authority, right? You know, look, I, I don't think, I don't think, uh, you know, it's a great question. I think my attorneys, you know, at some point were trying to figure out why would they go after me? Yeah. And I, th I think the reality was that I was, I was a, uh, I was perfect prey. You know, if we didn't just use some, some basic dynamics about you know, um, maybe unable to hire an attorney. Um, maybe they were they were just based on the fact that I was just young, based on the fact that I you know I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to do, how to respond, and because at the end of the day, so here's where it gets a little tricky. So at the end of the day, they they arrest you, but how you get convicted or if you get convicted, that's a that's a sort of different stage of it. That's going to court, it's a jury, so it, you know. You would assume that they they've done their part, yeah. But the problem, Lucky, is that when they follow the case all the way through, and go to court and swear to tell the truth or begin to lie, and they start they start um, 
they start involving themselves in that in that in that sacred process or that that process supposed to be um, you know clear of an influence when they start going in there and influencing maybe the DA who's on the case or the jurors by their own testimony or the witnesses overall. So when you're controlling the witnesses' testimony, you, you're going beyond investigation. You're now a puppet master. And so is that, I mean, so, you know, obviously my case is not the only case of wrongful conviction. A lot of the cases that, you know, that have been determined nowadays involve either, you know, law enforcement, falsifying evidence, um, you know, coercion, as we're talking about, and a number of other reasons. But I think, you know, it's, it's not just the arrest of this guy and let's see what happens. They arrest me, and then they, they follow the, the case all the way through and make sure that they get the outcome that they want. Yeah, and so that's that's why I was asking you a couple of the questions on, like, you know, what kind of relationship did you have with these guys? I mean, did you piss them off? You know, did they, you know, but it's, oh, man, it, it, check it out. I've done some bad things in my life, right? And it's not the person that I am now, but no how, no way would I want somebody to, you know, do life in prison. You know, if I was in a position of power, if I was a police officer, like, man, like, you know, fuck this little kid, any, you know, whatever. But, if I, you know, if I <laughs> if I wasn't sure that he killed this dude, like, I don't want the little dude doing life in not prison. What like, what kind of yeah. person is, d does that? And, you know, you know, like, look, even though, even though at the core of my case there's law enforcement corruption, you know, I don't believe that all cops are bad. I'm not, yeah. gonna, I'm not gonna go that. I'm not that guy's gonna go far and say, you know, all cops 100%. are bad. Like that's not my jam, you know. I just know, and I'm not gonna use terms like there's a bad apple. Like you know, there's there's sometimes um, bad influences. You know, I think about what happens in the joint. You know, there's this, this old school CO yeah. who's influencing the other younger COs to do this funky or this uh, you know disrespectful stuff, and you know how to talk to the to the guys and whatever. You know, you see it play out you see it you watch it when you're you're you know you see the 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 old staff influencing the young staff and then you know a month or two later that nice cop that showed up to you know for a career at you know in cdc or cdcr now has now been infiltrated and he's now thinking oh yeah it's us against them you know what i don't believe all i've i've, I've met some Badass CEOs where we were cool with. Them. I felt like they were the homies. You know what I mean? Like they look out in different ways, and they were just cool dudes, right? And I, and I've met police officers that were just, you know, they they were freaking human. Yep. You know, they yep. were just out to do their job. Um, I share a little bit of story. One time, I was leaving from here, and I wanted to get some tacos, right? And there's a spot down the street we're in East Los Angeles, right? And um, I pull in, but as soon as I pull into the taco spot, street taco spot, right? Fuck, um, there's there's a bunch of uh, a police police cars there. There's like five of them, and I'm like, fuck, man, you know. And I just wanted, I really just wanted to drive through because there was an alley that I can just pass them up and then just head out. But I, I felt like that was gonna be uh, suspicious, right? And so I just said, you know what, fuck it. I don't, I, you know, I'm not doing nothing wrong. I don't got nothing, you know, on me or anything like that, you know, because I don't live like that anymore. <laughs> And so I said, fuck it, you know? Um, and I, so I pulled in to get my tacos and, and they were all lined up right there making an order. And there was this one dude right there and um, I kind of broke the ice a little. I seen him side eyeing me a little bit, you know, right? Only natural, just the same way I'm doing him, you know? And, uh, and so I broke the ice and I said, man, I said, I'm surprised uh, uh, you guys are actually here ordering food instead of shutting uh, their, their, uh, their, their spot down. <laughs> And, and, the, and the, the police officer said like this, he goes, hey, you know what? These people are human right here. It was actually Monterey Police Department, Monterey Police Department there in the East LA side grabbing tacos. And he goes, you know what? These people are just trying to make a living. You know, they're just trying to make a living. And that's just not something that I do on my beat, on my watch, you know? And then it turned out, the dude used to play basketball with droops. Oh my god! <laughs> when before he was a police officer, okay. you know, because when we started like chopping it up a little, everybody knows droops, and uh, and and um, and you know, he was like, oh, you, oh, you, Holla Parks, oh, hey, you know, droops, mm -hmm. his brother Cleon, this that, and I was like, yeah, this is my boy. We were just blah blah blah, you know, and so, uh, anyways, no, but I'm with you. Look, I, look, I got some really good friends now in my life who are either on the force or retired. And, you know, folks, when I go to Sacramento, you know, former guards who 
where at Folsom when I was there, you know, we go have lunch, you know, I'm at their families, you know, events or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's interesting this morning, my daughter was asking me about I don't know, some random question, but I said, yeah, I, you know, some next girlfriend of mine. And she's like, where'd you meet her? I said, well, actually I knew her from, I knew her dad before I met her. How old is your daughter you're talking to? Uh, my daughter is six years old. She'll be seven soon. Curious, so she's, curious age. Oh man, she's, she's asking, you know, she's just asking me some questions and yeah. I'm just answering, right? And she's like, um, where'd you know, you know, the dad, you know, the, you know, tell him about the dad, right? So I'm like, well, <laughs> like, okay, I'll tell you. I'll make it brief. Yeah. I said, her dad was the prison guard who would lock me in my cell at Folsom. So, so, he, so you, your six-year-old knows where have you've, Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, it's it's. Uh, I'm open with the story, you know. I'm open with, huh. with uh, yeah. So I have a seven and eight year old daughter. Okay, and I don't I don't share that with them. You know, it's, it's after the Netflix series. It was a little hard to keep it, you know, okay. keep it away from them, you know. And I and I think I mean I use it. I use it for you know just to be a dad. I I, I parent through the story sometimes, you know. And and this case here, I, which was sort of like a moment of like, I listen to this little story, right? So I told her, you know, her dad was the prison guard. And when I came home, he, he tracked me down. He sent me an email and he said, hey, you know, I'm gonna be in Southern California when I'm down there next, like, let's grab some lunch. And by the way, my daughter lives down there and, and just also, by the way, she's single. I was like, oh, cool. So long story short, I started dating the prison guard's daughter. Hell yeah. And, you know, I, I say that not to be funny, but I, I say it because the guy, he, he knew that, I mean, he now knew that I was innocent, I was wrongfully there. But, you know, he, he knew my character. He knew what kind of guy I was on the inside. And, you know, he's a great guy. We talk every so often. But, you know, obviously his daughter and I didn't, it didn't work out. We broke up. But I think the, the yeah. for me, I say that because, you know, there's a lot of times where, you know, we might, we're the, we're the recipient of like, no, nah, I'm not going to be that guy's friend because he was in prison or <laughs> vice versa. I'm not going to be that guy's friend because he used to be a prison guard. So yeah. for me, I don't, I'm looking at you not for your job title or what you've done or where you've been, but more about who you are as a man. So let's go. Cool. Yeah. So that was cool. You know, absolutely, man. Well, that's, that's super dope that you have a dialogue with your young, beautiful, <laughs> curious daughter, bro, because man, are they curious. <laughs> oh, awesome. my best Shout conversations. Out. Daddy, what is, you know, what is God? God is, you know, my God, babe, God is everything around us. The trees, <laughs> everything. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, daddy, he's a, he, daddy, that guy that you have, because they know I have a podcast and it's funny sometimes, and I've shared this before, we go to restaurants and they embarrass the shit out of me. My daddy has a podcast because, you know, they don't know any better. And, That's cool. You know, and, 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 and I go places with them, you know, and people see me and with my kids and they come and handshake, want a picture, and it's super dope, bro. It's And so my kids are like, you know, you know, daddy daddy with the podcast, but, some, but some t what I was wanting to get at is, uh, daddy, you had that guy that was on prison in prison it's a bad guy this and that <laughs> well baby let me tell you this you know not all people are you know so we have these conversations are bad guys because they've been down that road mm -hmm. sometimes people make make mistakes you know and they learn from them or sometimes people are wrongfully accused and end up in places like that but just speak speaking of being a segue of we use this as a segue of being wrongfully accused you get taken in 16 years old for uh this murder Right. What is the first thing that is coming to your mind? I mean, is the world closing in on you? I mean, you know, you're innocent. So do you have obviously you have hope? You know, what, what, what is the first initial thought? You know, it, it's it's um, it's even trippy, man, because it's one of those things that, that I, I, you know, people ask. This is a question that comes up a lot. Right. But yeah, this is this is this is interesting, bro, because I I had. I had all the courage in the world for some bizarre reason. I, I felt like I was like emboldened by like, I'm walking to Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall, AB, and then I'm moving around the, uh, the the camps, whatever. And I just felt like I'm just here for a couple of days and these guys don't even know, but I'm, I'm leaving like in three days. Yeah. I had this like arrogance to me for, yeah. not, not, not like in a bad way, but I just felt like I was emboldened with like the truth. And the truth was that like, they made a mistake, I'll be out soon. Yeah. And, you know, that led to, that led to, you know, going to court, you know, being tried as an adult. And then that led to adult court, you know, facing a jury trial. And so, you know, little by little, you start wondering, you know, okay, this is not the way I thought it was going to turn out, right? It's been now three months or three, whatever. So, 
So the first, so the, the the first, your first trial, it was a hung jury. It was so, it, uh, and a hung jury for people that don't know what a hung jury is. So a hung jury, there's there's twelve jurors on a on a jury typically who are going to vote, and a hung jury is is what happens when the juries can't come to a, um, they can't decide either for guilt or innocence. So in my case, it was seven not guilty, five guilty. So it deadlocks. It just they can't go any further. So they've been, you know, you walk into a room and people are trying to convince each other, you know, either guilt or innocence. And in my case, um, hung jury. And so when a, when when there is a hung jury and one's fighting a case, uh, the case basically gets kicked out. It gets dropped. A hung jury, correct? Well, they the DA's. It's in the DA's hands, so they can decide. to pick it back up after the fact and start another trial. So in my case, you're right. So they they should have, so what happened with me? So I won't say what should have happened. What happened with me was that the jury came back with the, you know, deadlocked. It, it was a hung jury. And the my attorney was saying, well, you know, then he should go home now. Like this is, this is over. And long story short, the DA asked the judge to hold, keep me, keep me in custody well, she basically thinks about, is she going to retry me or not? And so they do. And they come back, I don't know, a week or two later to court. And she has decided to basically run it, you know, run this, you know, do another jury all over again. So. Um, Pick the case back yeah. up. Start from the beginning, so to speak. Yeah, I, I suppose so. How, how was your lawyer at the time? You know, I had a state appointed attorney. I got an attorney who was um, <clears throat> assigned to me. He, um. You know, I don't. I. I guess that there's a couple of characters in my story that I that I you know. <coughs> you know, want to ridicule. He's one of them. You know, I think I think, but I think it's by design. So he's. I'm 16 years old. He might have been in his 40s, maybe pushing 50 at the time, and he was looking at me as like, here's my my juvenile client. What does he have to say to me that's going to help the case? You know, and so I, I kind of get that breakdown, that, you know, exchange there. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I'm leaning on this guy's representation. So he's representing me. I'm the client. And I just felt like he he just felt that there was no need to, you know, engage me. He was basing it on the police reports. He was basing it on, you know, now a, a, a jury trial that had there was transcripts to it. So here's a good example of what what he should have been aware of. So I think what, what would have been number one was that he would have just engaged me um, and made it client-centered representation. So that means that like the client's at the center of this ordeal, let's see what's going on. Um, didn't do that. Didn't feel the need that he had to do that. Maybe he was overwhelmed, not to minimize you know, his lack of you know, being the best that he can be, but you know that's who I had. And so he was a state-appointed attorney, which is basically an attorney that's working in the same office with the DA. No, I, th I think that no. The, the, I think a state appointed attorney is he's that's a, a he's public a defender. I'm talking about. So there's tiers of it. So no, so the DA's office works. That they're they're independent. So it's it's the DA's office, and then we have another de office, the public defender's office, and okay. we have the alternate public defenders. Then we have another body, um, which is a they're basically private attorneys, which are state appointed attorneys who who say, hey, I'm, if you need me, I'm available. Okay. And then, of course, a private attorney that has nothing to do with. So, what is the benefits of a state appointed attorney to offer their services to uh, the state, the county? That's a great question. You know, I do I, they you get know, because you know, why would you offer your? Do they get paid from them a, a certain you know, you know amount what, of money? Yeah, you don't. Yeah, they definitely get. They're definitely on the payroll. They're the okay. county. The county is paying their 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 time. So. What I learned about this specific attorney, Robin Yanes, is that he had a pretty big caseload. He, you know, he was, this is in the Compton Courthouse. So he had, that was like his bread and butter. Like there's cases, especially cases maybe to do with, um, to do with, um, you know, violent crimes. Maybe he was the guy that they assigned someone like me to. And so, you know, I, I don't know, dude. I, you know, the day I met him, he walks in, I'm on a, I'm a you know, there's like 15 adults and then, you know, little old me on this, on this, uh, court chain and we walk into arraignment and I hear someone say you know my name they call my name and here comes this dude in this you know really nice tan suit he looked good looking guy I figured oh man this is the one you know yeah and then he's you know says hey you know I'm your lawyer gives me his card 
and you know we went from there but um to my point was so during my during my first trial this was a moment i thought this case is over with i'm going to go home so the star witnesses on the stand scotty scott turner's his name so scotty's up there and to his credit he says well you know if you know tell us more about how you know frankie's the guy who shot donald starpy he says well like I, you know i went to school with frankie frank and i were in the same class we you know we interacted at lunch or whatever so as a jury i, I suppose you're you're taking that in as like wow that's pretty compelling not only do you remember him from the shooting but the guys in your classroom he named whatever subject right yeah and so then he says well what, what else you know how else can you connect them to this crime he says well my my friend actually kicked frankie's ass one day he, oh did he huh okay then what happened he says well he took you know my friend was you know was getting the best of frank and he tore frankie's shirt off he had like a slingshot or whatever he, he tore that off and it exposed that he had a big yc on his on his chest over his heart big old english he went with details you know and i looked over at my attorney and i said i don't have a single tattoo on my body like this dude is confusing me with now some other stories about gangs and school and whatever. You know, were fights. you? Did you? Were you in a, a class with him? So the school that they described me attending, you know, the school that he said, you know, I go to school. I go to Linwood High School with with Frankie. I have never attended Linwood High School one day in my life. Well, that's easy then. I mean, right? I'm thinking as as a kid who's yeah. not who's not legally trained. I'm thinking, shit, this case is over with. Yeah, this is over. Bring in, bring in, I don't know who you have to bring in. Bring in the high school transcripts of where he goes. And so we, and so what happened was that, you know, I look, I lived on 6 and East Mott here in East LA. Uh, Mom was living there, so I was using her address, but I was going to school in Sure High School in Montebello. So for me, it was like the paper trial was there. I'm like, look, I, I attend Sure High School. I do not attend Linwood High School. But my point is, you know, even though it would have been a little bit embarrassing for me, lucky, my attorney should have said, Frankie, I know this is going to be a little painful for you, but can you take off your shirt and show the jury your chest? I mean, it's, I feel like it's one on one, right? Easy. Case Easy over. Math. Case over. Hundred percent. Forget the hung jury. This case. I mean, this yeah. is your star witness saying not only did he shoot high school tattoo, and so, oh my god. So, so that's how I that's how I judge him, bro. I don't judge him because what he was wearing or whatever. I'm just like this is like a moment in time that I can never forget. Was your only support system during this time fighting this case your your pops? You know, I, I um, you know, I, there was folks who were coming to the court. So you know, my sisters were coming, pops. Because mom. there's got to be people in the background saying, "Hey, check it out," in his ear. Hey, bro. Yeah, but I, I think um, this is playing. This is being played out live. This is this is court. This is like on the spot. And I think like if you are asleep at the wheel and you don't even see that. Or, or have a, a recess with the judge, or I don't know, something, right? Do something there. Wow. So. You know. That's, that's horrible. You yeah. know what, I wanna, I wanna share this. So we have an, an attorney, his name's Doug Sherrod. He used to be a federal prosecutor, and he used to be a district attorney for the, for the county of Los mm -hmm. Angeles, right? And I had him on, on the podcast, and you know, hey, this, this came out his mouth, you know? Right. And he said, you know what, Lucky? Um, I am in a private attorney now because I didn't like the politics on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. Now, what would happen, he said, is uh, I might be getting this part wrong, but every week there would be uh, there would be paperwork on the wall of who won these many cases, who won who won who won and lost. Right. Right. St uh, stats. Mm. Right. Like baseball stats, basketball mm. stats, football stats, you know, and and people would go. They, all the attorneys, district attorneys, fed, you know, whatever side that he was on, they would look at this, and that you would be deemed as a winner mm. or a loser. And 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 so he broke that down very specifically. Doug shared. Hoodstock's podcast. Pip, pip, you guys peeped that out, man. It was a really good interview, man. I watched it. It's a really good one. Yeah, yeah. And, and he said, you know what? This is not what I'm about, you know? And and so just going back with the dude, the Scotty, mm -hmm. the star witness, right? And obviously he had you confused with somebody else right. or he had something prepared for him, you know? To, 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 to present 
to the court. No matter who was there as, as a defendant. He might have just had, you're right, he might have just had a script that the cop made sure that he, he executed no matter if it was Frankie or Louie or Chewy or whoever, right? Who's the white lady on the on the Netflix special? Is that the is she the DA? Was she the DA yeah. on the case? Yep, she was, yeah. And it seems like she was like she, it seems like on the Netflix special that she was not holding nothing back. Like she was saying, "Hey, if you're saying this is the guy, we need you to really say this mm. is the guy." And and it, obviously she held a lot back, probably. Right. You know, yeah, she I, said I, that. I, yeah. I misspoke on that. All right, uh, but you can see through her. I mean, I could see through her on the Netflix special and saying there's a whole lot more that happened in that background yeah. besides if, uh, from what she's <laughs> talking about on this special. You know, bro, but, like, I mean, there's there's a lot of fingers of blame, right? I can I can hit my attorney, her, the cops, but, you know, some self-reflection throughout the years, and this is not to minimize what they did, but I want to just kind of get this into the conversation, is that, you know, bro, I was, I was a six-year-old boy, man that was going through this as to your question about you know who was there with me who was who had my who was my you know who was in my corner right yeah end of the day you're going through this by yourself you're these these you know these um these potential conversations with your attorney you know there was a couple just me and him you know what what do we do now or or or, or what questions ask i didn't know but my point is that You know, bro, I was brought up not knowing the power of my voice. Ooh. And it and it all became pretty apparent when I was in court, unaware to express myself. Because you were thinking all of this. This is reflection, bro. This is 2020 okay. here, right? But yeah. when it's happening, I don't even know what's happening. I'm just thinking, I'm leaning on, on the adults. I'm not even thinking about like, you know, let me move over Robin Yane's attorney, I'm gonna do it myself. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just there for the ride, bro. I'm, I'm a kid yeah. who was relying heavily on the adults to do the right thing. May that be my attorney, the, the, the DA, the judge, the jurors, everybody. I mean, witnesses, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you um, and, and remembering things my dad told me, which is if you're ever in trouble, the adults will do the right thing, lean on them or, or rely on them. And so here I am in adult court as a juvenile doing just that. So, so that you get you get retried, uh, <laughs> all the all the actors or the people that were in play before now they get it right, right? They get it right. Uh, they close the deal. They get the W. They sentence you to what? Did they sentence you to? So I got a I got a uh, consecutive sentence. So I got a thirty years to life. So twenty five years to life plus. Five years for the gun, so 30 years of life for Donald Sharpie's murder. Then I got six life sentences that were brought down to one single life sentence. Uh, bow legging is what they say. So you had to do one sentence first, and then you, before you begin the other one. So it was this. this um, it sure. wasn't ran concurrent, it was ran consecutive. Consecutive, exactly. So that's, you, wow. you know what that means, yeah. Oh, shit. So the day that sentence is handed down to you um do they ask you because sometimes like and, and i'm just going to be uh one of the guys in the in the chat right now or the audience they yep. don't know no better you know we see it in movies sometimes right i'm going to put myself there do they ask you if uh uh frankie carrillo uh do you have anything that you would like to say on your sentencing i mean did yeah, they ask no. you nothing like that they just handed it to you and and took you back away to your holding cell put you on the fucking gray goose mm -hmm. back to wherever you're going okay yep. uh, so i want to rewind it a little bit so th so th was it the second time that they tried you as an adult or were you trying an adult from the from the for the first time and the second time so it's so it's it's one one you've been tried once and it kind of carries over. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. But I'm now you're, I'm now 18. You're, you're Second eight, trial, I'm 18 years old. Yeah. But you, but you ended up in youth authority. I did for the next I think five years. I was in in, in CYA. CYA. Okay. Yeah. And so before we get to that, um, when you back to what I was asking you, when that time was handed down to you, bro, do you remember? what your initial thought was. So this was December of 1992. And my initial thought was, 
trying to calculate what that what that meant. I didn't know concurrent, consecutive, like the guys back in the county were breaking that down to me. But when I hear 30 years to life at 18 years old, you know, I was, you know, I had trouble as, as a young boy trying to imagine a month down the line. So they were, they were forcing me by saying those words to think about what that meant. Like how long, so I'm thinking, how long am I going to be in prison? Or how long, how long is this going to, like how long is this sentence? And it was so absurd to even, my mind couldn't even make that mathematical, I couldn't envision it. That equation. To yeah, I, I just, I was just like, and then you hear the word life and, you know, what that means. And, you know, so. Um, what does your attorney tell you? You know, my attorney, my attorney, um, he didn't say much, man. He didn't, there was no, there was no, um, you know, do good or you'll be fine or there'll, there'll be an appeal. We just, you know, it was over. Like his, he was moving on to something else, I guess. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough situation. That's you know, I, I think about it. Lucky is like you know here, you know I don't I don't I'm not I'm not judging someone for you know mistakes they've done and they've been sentenced and they've I've seen many men, um, you know, reform and, and get their you know they they life whatever whatever it is that happens that magic occurs right they they uh, mature out of it you know they age out of it they realize uh, the errors of the mistake you know it's such a beautiful sight to see you know. Um, but early on, everyone's broken, man. No one's trying to, uh, I mean, as much as I want to say, I was trying to calculate how many years, like I didn't, it's, I mean, it's just a response, but the reality was that I was just thinking, now what? What's next? What's next? Where am I going to next? Huh, man, that's, that's deep, that's tough, bro. And so I've had a lot of the fellas on here, I've had a lot of individuals on here, uh, young dudes that, uh, that have, have caught time. That I, I believe maybe the difference with you is uh, some of these guys really did do it, which, you know, they're telling their story, bro. Yeah. You know? Now, for someone that didn't do it, and, and this is unloaded on you, uh, that's just, uh, that's, that's a whole nother level. But a lot of the guys say, hey, you know what? Fuck it, dog, it happened, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just said, fuck it, I'm going hard. I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you know? So, but you, you're just, you're just, it seems like, you're just sitting passenger on your own ride, so right. to speak. You're right. sitting passenger, <laughs> you know? Like, bro, like, you go to CYA. Back then, that was no joke. Mm -hmm. How was that experience? You, you get taken over. The you know, bro, it's, it's um, you know, I, I've always been a very optimistic kid, man. No matter, you know, mom is out the picture or we're, we're, we're poor or... Whatever's going on, man. Were you like, an athletic kid? You know, I wasn't, man. My okay. dad, my dad, to his credit, man, I, I would criticize him heavily throughout my, my youth, man. But, you know, my dad wasn't into like, I'm gonna put you in softball or baseball or soccer. His 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 jam was like, hey, I know so-and-so who owns a roofing company. Go work for him for a couple of weekends. Okay. I got so-and-so who's a tile layer. Go, sh go learn how to do that. It seems like you were very just like I mean. It seems like you you were a good kid. Like I was, you, bro. You, like you weren't a troublemaker. I mean, maybe you were hanging around some of the wrong guys, and maybe you were there sometimes. When you know, but it doesn't seem like it seems like from what you're telling me, the vibe that I'm catching from you is that you were kind of like an innocent dude. You know, just caught up in a you know, some yeah. shit that you weren't. <laughs> you were not ready for it. And so I asked if you were an athletic person because sometimes people are just, they put their game face on right, and they say, right. fuck it, dog. Let's go, let's, let's, let's play ball. You know what I did, you know, so maybe not athletic in the sense of like, um, you know, a team player, but you know, I was part of the, the boxing clubs in the neighborhood and, you know, but I, fighting was what people did back then. So that was a form of communication for the youngsters, you know, but. Okay. But so, I, so you weren't afraid back then to catch a fade at all? Oh, yeah, no, no. That was that was sort of, you know, I mean. The way I, you I mean, grew up, right? Old school way. You know, bro, it, it wasn't only that. Like, you know, here's here's what, I, you know, back to my kids, right? Yeah. Or I think I told the kids or maybe Netflix or somebody, another podcast or, I don't know, talking to my sleep or something. But, <laughs> you know, I, I've, been, I've been stabbed, bro, at least 10 times before I even went to, to jail. Okay. So this is, this is, you know, not because, you know, I just, you know, asked someone to stab me. Like, you know, you're having a fight and I don't know where some guy pulls a knife out and then you're bleeding and then something else happens in another, you know, situation. But 
like that neighborhood sort of scuffling and I mean, luckily for me, bro, the, the worst thing was, uh, you know, being stabbed. Dudes had been, you know, I know friends who are paralyzed or being shot or killed. Yeah. But, you know, I say that to say is that, you know, I, it, it was, I, I was, I made the best out of my environment, you know, moving forward into the next chapter of what, you know, what happened to me. But even before I got arrested, you know, dudes were, dudes were tough, man. You know, this is, this is a tough side of town. You know, the, the Compton, Watts, Linwood, yeah. you know, dynamic there was, was rough, man. And, you know, dudes were, you know, it's, it's I mean, it's sort of funny. I, I met a guy since I've been out uh, who told me he had never had a fist fight. And I couldn't believe it, man. Was, so, was he was he fucking like six eight and looked like Shrek? Nah, <laughs> dude, he was just it was a regular regular guy, right? But yeah. I thought I, I really couldn't imagine that there were there were there were men out there who had never had a fist fight ever. It, it I, was hard for me to believe that. I think Casey's one of them, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Casey's the one I've of them. I've been in one fist fight. One fist that's fight. Right, that's one right. fist fight. Congratulations. Casey, Casey is a good dude, bro. <laughs> Casey is 100% a good dude, and I don't ever, like, if anything ever happens with the fellas, you know, sometimes the, the streets are wild, bro, you know? And I expect one thing for Casey to do, and that's for him to run for his life. <laughs> <laughs> I need a scissor fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, real shit. Hey, Mondo, let me get, let me get a giant Coke, man. I'm loving this conversation right here and I need to have a little whiskey with this baby you know what I mean if you don't mind oh brother. my god please brother yeah um so you get you get sent to CYA I mean what bro back then that was just like you hear uh war stories you hear uh, YA babies I mean these dudes um it's it, the, the, the 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 cream of the crop criminals all go get filtered through this juvenile system. See, and it just sets them up for a lifelong mm. fucking world of fucking chaos and disaster. And they just fucking slurp it up like a 7-Eleven Slurpee on a hot day. I mean, it's just, it is what it is, <laughs> you know. But here you go, bro, going with the flow, sitting passenger to your yourself, yep. you know. Um how was your introduction to the C, uh, uh, California Youth Authority system? You know, bro, it's actually, it's actually, uh, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but I, I really enjoyed myself in, the, in Hawaii. I had, I had How a so? You know, so I, so. I have never heard anybody say that you know, shit. I, <laughs> I, I had, I had, um, so when I left the county jail after, well, actually there was a 90 day observation back then. So you yeah. go there and you, SRCC in Norwalk. You go there and they assess you and you come back and you get sentenced. So now I'm, I'm there officially. So I'm back in SRCC. And you know, I, you know I, don't, I don't think it's about reputation or if it's about status or what kind of juice you have or don't have. It's just about like, if you can, if you can sort of master your new, your new world, bro, your new, your new environment and, and away from, away from, you know, all the, all the obvious things, right? Like the divisions and the lines and who has to hang out with who, whatever. It's just about like, this is, for me, it was like a situation where like, this is my new microcosm of the world. And I'm gonna, and I, I, I know how to, I know how to move. I, I didn't even know I knew how to move, bro, but it, it worked out for me. Well, you were, yeah, well, it makes sense, brother, because, you know what I mean? You navigated through those streets of Linwood, right? You know what I mean? Compton, Linwood, you know what I mean? You know, South Central, I mean, you know, you, you already knew how to navigate through a jungle and now you're in the concrete jungle. So it, it 100% makes sense. I mean, did you have, uh, um, you, you said, all right, this is my world. And, and I've, it, it, dude, I've, I used to call uh, Droops he, uh, sometimes, my yeah, boy yeah. Droops right here. Uh, I call him, uh, I would, I'd rarely call him, you know? And he goes, hey dog, how come you don't call me? All the homies call me. And my response to that, he's not in here right now, but my response was that is like, bro, like this is my island right here. Mm -hmm. This is the world that I live on. And the less that I hear about that, bro, the easier it is for me to navigate and just function through my mm -hmm. island and understand this is what my life is and I'm gonna deal with it. So it sounds like you 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 did that. I mean, did you have any, all those, you know, you hear about a lot of dudes having you know, a lot of YA games played and, and all that bullshit. You know, bro, first of all, there was a lot of guys that I, I grew up with that were there as well. Some okay. of them, some had already been there for a while and some were like my age and were kind of arriving at the, arriving at the same time. So, 
Um, so the journey was from SRCC, and I was sent to DeWitt Nelson. So DeWitt is in the, in Stockton. So it was like Carl Holton, DeWitt, Fred, um, Chad was there, had just opened, and a, a fourth um, YA. And I was there for a few months, and it turns out that um, Scotty Turner happened to be there too. So the star witness was was in YA at at uh, DeWitt Nelson. And one day the staff called me and say, hey, you know, we have to lock you up because, you know, caught word you're threatening one of the, like another ward. I'm like, you know, anyway, long story short, they tell me who, who that ward was, Scotty Turner. And um, it was, it's interesting, bro. There was uh, two Norteños there. I remember this guy named uh, Indio from Stockton and like Blanco from, Anjo or something, you know, it was, it was a, a black guy going by a Nino name. Yeah. And the other guy was like a Gavacho with like a, whatever, like a Chicano. They were, they were solid dudes, man. And, you know, back then it was, I wasn't, they were, they came over and said, Hey, look, this guy's running with us. He's, you know, he's running with, you know, the, that black car was linked up with the Norteños. He's like, you know, if you want to, you know, ask, you know, you want them to show up to the library, you want to deal with them. They were trying to, you know, set up a little move there. Right. But. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't fall for it, bro. I didn't, you know, not, nothing came about it. So instead, they just transferred me to YTS. So for the next four years of my life, I was at YTS. And, you know, when I arrived to YTS, I arrived at night. It was uh, me and another partner of mine from um, just a guy from Southern California who was on the bus heading down from Northern California. And, um, and I'll tell you, bro, it was just a, um, it was an eye-opening experience. And I'll, and I'll, you know, say this and I'll, I'll, I'll pause. I I learned early on when I got to the juvenile hall system that whatever level of tough that I knew or that I thought I was in was low level, dude. I was with some dudes who had been doing this from from diapers, you know. Yeah. And these are like professional juvenile hall kids. They've been they've been doing it. They dudes on violations. Like okay, whatever I think I got, you know, it's, 100%. it's I'm, I'm you know. Yeah. Let me let me forget that, right? But when I got to YA, what I realized, Lucky, was that the level of psychological warfare that was going on there intrigued me. I was so intrigued that these men, these young men, had gone from fistfights and physical altercations in most cases that they had now evolved into this like psychological warfare with each other. You know, to your point about these YA games or whatever, right? Yeah. And they, they, I, I mean, for me, bro, like they, it, I saw. I would say that it, it, it played out with certain people and play out across the line. Like, you know, everyone didn't experience that, but but yeah, I was I was really fascinated with that uh, with the evolution of, of kind of where as you moved around, kind of how that played out. So it seems like you just really had a, you know, some cats, man, they have a world of hurt coming their way in there for whatever reason. Maybe it's their character, it's their personality. Maybe they got a big fucking mouth, right? character personality mm -hmm. but it seems like you were just a low-key dude and you were able to just do your time move through there with respect mm -hmm. people respected you i think so yeah you know you didn't cause any problems i mean what are you doing during this time i mean you're sinking in now to to doing starting this stretch of a sentence you served 20 years until uh your 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 case was uh um, what's the word? Exonerated. For, uh, yeah, exonerated. Yeah. Shit, let's don't play with it, right? Um, did you start? Did were you reading a lot? Were you studying? I mean, what was your daily process in the beginning and throughout doing your time? That's a great question, Lucky. Um, you know, I think early on, what what I had to deal with privately was coming to grips with what had happened. How long did that take? You know, it it um it depends who was around. You know, it might have happened the whole time when I was privately in my cell and I would cry or whatever, right? But I think that... The, would you cry in your cell? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think that the first, the, the, the impact of what had happened hadn't faded, hadn't, hadn't gone away yet. By the, but by the time I got to YTS, I had both feet were on the ground, both eyes were open. And I wasn't, I wasn't a big reader, man. You know, I've, I've never been, you know, I've, I've always had a, a checkered past with, with you know, education as a, as a young youngster. But what I realized, and there was a very critical moment in my life, was that I got a I got a signed an appellate attorney, and he said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm your new appellate attorney. You know, you, you get one by default. I'm your guy. 
And long story short, he sends me a letter one day and says, you've been denied, you know, whatever grounds we, we use or I used, uh, the court has rejected you. And this is as far as I'm going to go. And what year is this into your... This uh, is 93. This is 93. So this is basically like a year, two years later, mm -hmm. you know, that you're trying to appeal your, your, your sentencing. Exactly. And so how long until you went into your, uh, until you hit the state system? So this is, we're, we're in state now. We're, we're like state appeal level. Okay. We're, 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 so you're in state prison now. No, no, I'm, I'm still in, in YTS. Okay. When did you, when, when was the point that you went into the state prison system? So let me, let me hit you with this last no, go ahead. about I'm the sorry. education part. Yeah. So the guy sends me this rejection letter and denial. And then he says, and if you want to continue on your own, here's a cheat sheet. Here's a kind of how to, uh, if you want to proceed on your own. So again, Bob, I'm maybe 19 years old now, if that, maybe late 18. And um, I'm looking at this piece of paper thinking, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a foreign language basically. And I, it seems simple enough. And so I, I borrowed a typewriter, I borrowed some paper, like a dictionary. And, I, and I, I did my best to appeal to the California Supreme Court. So I wrote them a one page letter uh, saying, you know, my appellate attorney has informed me that I've been denied in that lower level. I'm now appealing to you. I've been wrongfully convicted. You know, maybe a, a couple paragraphs of just some mumble jumble, right? Just trying to put something together. And so I, I, I send it out very confidently that the, the, the California Supreme Court would like listen to me. Like here's another group of, attor of, of um, attorneys, obviously, judges and adults. And sure enough, soon after I get a letter they call me to the unit and say, hey, you got legal mail and I sign off for it. And it's a very beautiful envelope. I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, they have like a very old English font, very court, you know, very formal. I mean, the, the envelope looks serious, you know? Yeah. So I get back to my cell and I open it. And before I can get into the words, I see the big red stamp that said- um, Denied. Denied, you know? And, um, you know, of course I'm crying, bro. I'm like thinking, damn, here we go again, right? And this is, this is now, juries, the appeal, now the Supreme Court. And, you know, once I wiped my tears off, man, I, I looked at that envelope again and I read that letter fully and it was definitely still denied. But what they did to me that changed my life, Lucky, was that they sent me what I had sent them. So they sent me that one page, the little rinky dink letter that I wrote and they they returned it to me. So it was, it was two papers, their denial and then my, my so-called appeal. Yeah. And it was a moment where I, I felt that I had I had I had read it for the first time, and when I when I read it, I was embarrassed that I misspelled my name. Oh my god! Yeah. What I was saying was heavily emotional. Um, there wasn't much there that made any sense about any legal jargon. You know, it was just like it was basically a May Day Hail Mary, right? Yeah. Help me cry. Yeah. Help yeah. me correct us. Yeah. But that that. Instead of that taking me deeper into this rabbit hole, it actually awakened me to say, like, look, if I'm ever going to communicate with the outside world, I need to learn how to read, write, um, formulate a sentence. And so the next number of years, it seemed like the rest of my life now was just really focusing on just trying to better myself. You started educating yourself. Yeah, I just started, I started, there was a lot of programs and there was, there was obviously avenues that you can take advantage of that would... Um, that would strengthen who you are. I mean, you, you, I started realizing that, like, look, there's a, there's a lot to be done. You can lift weights all day long, but you can also, you know, absorb information and so on. So, and so I did a little bit of both. But the reality was that, like, that moment that maybe could have broken me even deeper, I used it to my advantage. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I did. I I, I didn't. <laughs> Thank God. You know, I mean, I I did not have to go down the road that you went down, you know, but just in regards to, you know, doing time, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a dreamer, bro, you know? And so <laughs> I always read, I always read fantasy books, bro. Mm -hmm. I read books that would take me away from where I was at. And, and I, and, and, uh, I got introduced to these fantasy books. I think he was, uh, his name was, uh, Letty from, uh, uh, San Pedro, uh, Rancho. And, um, he, he goes, hey, dog, all the white boys read these books, bro. You know what I mean? But they're fucking bomb, bro. And they'd be these fucking 
fucking thousand page books, bro. You know, and, and so I, I would, just speaking a little bit of myself, mm. which I always do and people hate when I do it. I but, love when you do it, brother. But, but I, I, bro, I would be in a world of warlocks, mm. people that had magic, you know what I mean? Like that, <laughs> that's how I would, but, but there's, there is a lot of, of homies, individuals, men, kids in there that utilize that time and I've never met so many smart dudes, wasted talent in there, like guys in there reading books, dudes that could recite back and forth of just some like maybe a penal code books and mm. it, it is just, it's it's amazing and, and I always until, to, I always thought that you were that guy, mm. you know? I thought you were, you were it's, but it sounds like you had to be that guy to get yourself out of there. Were you, did you start communicating with a, a, a white lady? Is Was it a lady that's, that you? Uh, it was a black lady. A black lady. Well, well, the thing about the reading that, that eventually it evolved, you yeah. know, I definitely you know picked up one too many books, and you know I I enjoyed reading when I was on the inside more than I do now. But you know I, that's sort of part of you know par for course, right? You're you're doing time and yeah. there's books everywhere. But you know what happened now? Uh, luckily, was that the next you know the next fifteen years of my life, you know I I you know one come of age. I'm you know I'm getting a little bit older now. And, um, I'm kind of bouncing around. I end up going to you know to the joint. And, you know, my, my journey, my journey kind of, it's, it's an interesting launch, but my journey when I was still at white, when I got to YTS, someone said, I don't know if it was a staff member or one of the guys, you know, I, I shared my story with them. Maybe it was a Sally possibly. And I remember what they said was just make some noise, just make some noise. And at the time making noise was writing letters and more letters and potentially maybe a phone call, but it was collect calls back then. But you know, the, the, the message was make some noise to be heard that someone will eventually hear you on the outside and basically come to your rescue. And so for the next year, 15 years, I, I made, I made some noise, you know, and this has come from a kid who, who attempted, you know, I testified in court, you know, for myself, obviously, like, you know, I didn't do it. I was with my dad. And so that voice was shut down. So when it came to making noise, I think even culturally making noise was like frowned upon. Like you don't, you don't scream, you don't, you don't get loud. You, it's a tight lit community. It's exactly. Within, so, the, within the Latino community. So that was working against somebody who's, who's, who's on the path to make some noise, right? So, um, you know, eventually I got the, the attention of, of the outside world. So I was writing, but prior to that, I, you know, I, I had raised money. I had, you know, hired the wrong people. How did you raise money? That's you know, I was, in a, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, um, how would one raise money in a, in a, in a cell? So when I was in, when I was in the joint, now I'm moving a little bit further down the story, but when I was in the joint, I realized that what I needed was an investigator, an attorney. And I, I just started, I just use just good old fashioned tactics about like, you know, if it's a go fund me, go fund me mentality back then, which is like, look, I'm, these are my circumstances that I'm in. I am uh, in need of uh, financial support for this specific reason, this case, an attorney or an investigator to help me get to the bottom of this. So I think I raised about $80,000 and um, it was just a one shot fundraiser. And I got the word out and you know some, some, some folks who had some money to, to contribute to this cause of this guy who was wrongfully convicted. You know, many people gave, but ultimately, um, it was it was one of the attempts to make some noise. Eighty thousand dollars. That's no small amount yeah, of money. A lot of money. How how was your uh just a little just to kind of get off get off of a little bit of the topics that we're on right now. Your living conditions in there, obviously, you know, you're in prison, you're in a cell, right? Uh pops took care of you the whole time. I mean, uh Money on the books? Did you always have money on the books? You know, bro. So when I got arrested, and I, I feel to to share this, but it's also part of the series, is that my girlfriend was pregnant. So I had a young I had a young girlfriend. So I was sixteen, she was fifteen, and soon after our son Theo was born. And so for a while, I had my, my you know my my girlfriend. I guess is what I referred to her as. And so that was that was comforting. You know, write me letters and. You know, send me, you know, when I got to where I got to, maybe send me some money or a package. But I had some sisters, some great sisters. I had uh, other family members who, you know, knew the system and so on. So I had people who had 
had my back. You had a support system I in did, there. Yeah. You weren't without. Correct. And how long, how long, this is just a little bit of a petty question, you know what I mean? Um, but how long was the girlfriend, how long did she hang with you? You know, bro, she, um, you know, I've never shared this before, but I'll give you, I'll give you some insight here, bro. So, and here's an example about like the YTS, you know, life that was unfolding, right? So, you know, YTS is shut down now and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get anybody in trouble because I'm sure, you know, people know these kind of stories who were there. But the Catholic Church was a was a was a meeting place for the fellas. So back then, didn't matter if, where you were, but specifically in, in YTS, you went to church to pass a wheel, say cuvo to the guys who just pulled up. You're there socializing. It's a social club, the church. Yes, sir. And no disrespect to the church, you know, I grew up Catholic and I went to a, a Catholic uh, Jesuit university. But the, the Catholic Church was was um, very welcoming for those dynamics, right? And so there was volunteers who would come and be part of the, you know, just the inner workings of the of the services and so on. And um, you know, because of what I was doing there, there was there was an opportunity to um, pretend that my girlfriend was also one of the church volunteers. Oh, baby. And, and sneak her into the, into the, so she was going to be, contra, her, her body was going to be contraband and lie and say she's a church volunteer and she was going to be here to, you know, whatever, right? Um, help, help the priest or whatever. And so I gave her a call and said, hey, like, you down? And it's been, it's been some years now, right? It's like, <laughs> and she's like, you know, it's a big ass, man. Yeah. She was going to, you know, show up early and she talked to, you know, the other ladies over there and what was your initial thought of it asking her if she's down what was your initial thought you know bro it's it's uh it's You're trying a, to get some pussy dog be honest I, I, bro. You know, i'm trying to get laid man i'm trying to <laughs> yeah let's go baby you know it's it's, it's about man, dog. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's about year i don't know whatever year year three i guess you're pushing four yeah you know maybe three and um you know this is this is stuff you don't hear about dude but like it's you know it, it's what happens right yeah and i convinced her enough for her to say yeah i'll do it and so you know, I'm pumped up. It was going to be the month later or a couple of weeks later. And so I get to, I get to, uh, I get to church, you know, I was in K and L or whatever. So we move you know, church move and we go there and, you know, everyone's there. And, and, um, I see, I see my point person. She just like, she didn't show basically. Right. She's like, I'll, t I'll tell you later, but she was basically telling me she's not here. And so, um, you know, I took that as like, look, here's an opportunity. It's, it's a ballsy. It's asking for a lot. But I just, my, my thinking was, you had an opportunity to be with your man. Yeah. And you passed that up. So that must mean there must be somebody else. 100%. And yeah. so, like, I didn't take it personal. I just said, okay, like, look, like, that's, if that's what I needed. And so that's kind of where we, where we wrap that up, you know. But it's hard. I think it's really hard for, uh, for partners who are supporting their, their loved ones on the inside. Husbands, you know, boyfriend, girlfriends, you know, to be, uh, to be, um, it's it's a hard world, bro. I mean, it's it's difficult. You know, I, I don't know if I could do it. Well, shout out to all the women that are holding somebody down within the system. You know, however you're doing it, you're doing it. You know what I mean? And check it out. You know, you know. There, and there's some haters too that be like, oh, these dumbass females no. that are. But nah, you know what? You you do what you do. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I, I went. I got I, some. I, let me just say, bro. I yeah. have some really good friends who who are the wives of some of some gentlemen who were there and when i when i when i know the the commitment and and the love and and the companionship that they offer uh their husbands and their boyfriends specifically their husbands it it, it touches my heart man it's such a it's such a, a beautiful experience just recently uh there was an exonerate miguel solorio whose wife had been by his side for 25 years sylvia and he just he's been out for about a month and a half now and to see this 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 uh, this wife who who waited, and the and the dude came home, and you know now their husband and wife. It's a, I'm sure it's a different dynamic now, but yeah. like he, they're they're still a unit, which was really cool. That's crazy. I had a I want to share this with you, brother. I'm on a pro violation. I mean, I'm the king of pro violations. I'm the king of wino time, bro. You know what I mean? I was considered one of those regulars going in and out of Chino State Prison on pro violations. Man, I've been just very blessed not to have done any uh, longer than f a five year uh, term at one time, you know what I mean? A lot of pro violations though, that add up to uh, 13 plus years in the system, right? Mm. 
um, I was on this pro violation and there was this black dude, CO, man. And he was just, I mean, he was just like, he would go out of his way in the chow hall of movement to getting chow dinner time. Um, to always tell me what's up, bro. Mm. You, for some reason, I don't know. You know what I mean? The homies be like, "Hey, what's up with that food? That food like you or something, dog?" Like, <laughs> like, I, yeah. I'm like, I don't know, dog. He fucks with me. He's cool, dog. He cool with everybody, dog. You know what I mean? He's a black CEO. He cool, dog. You know, which there's a lot of them, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's there's the assholes, you know. But he was one of the cool ones. But every time he see me, he'd be like, "What's up, Colos?" That's my last name, right? Yeah. He goes, "What's up, Colos?" And I said, shit, I'm about to get this chicken right now, bro. You know what I mean? You know, I just got to pluck the feathers off at first because they would give us this chicken that had feathers still on that bitch, dog. That shit was nasty, <laughs> dog. Yeah, the Yardbird, dog. You know what it is, K-9, the Yardbird. And, but every time in Chow Hall movement, he would always just like, and I'd be like, what's up with you? And he goes, shit, all you motherfuckers are busted. Mm. Shit, I'm out here fucking to carrying the load. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 He's like, I'm busy out here. Oh, you motherfuckers are busted. <laughs> and it was, and, and you know, it was just a casual, That's it funny. was a conversation like, hey, dog, it's all good. Keep the pussy warm, homie. I'll be out in a minute, homie. Lighten that load up, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm just doing a pro violation. But so, so let me let me, let me start for yeah. Go ahead. I need to use your hand. Yeah, let's Give take a, a break. Let's get let's get ads. Let's take a break. Is uh is the bathroom uh? All right, here we go. We just got a bottle. All right, everybody, let's get to this. Let's get to this. Let's get to this. I think Droopy's been in the bathroom for the last thirty minutes. Oh my lord. All right, all right. Here we go. Here we go. So big love to Apish OG. You can cop all the amazing flavors of O of Apish OG at OG Nation in the city of Maywood, okay? So come get your flowers and edibles. You know, OG Nation is a one-stop shop for all your cannabis needs, all right? So follow Apish OG on Instagram, and that's at Apish underscore OG. That is at Apish underscore OG. All right, check this out. If you need any jewelry or cash loans, our personal jeweler, Delio the Jeweler, has multiple companies who approve financing for his jewelry, all right? You want that jewelry you've been eyeing or want to design, but you want to play monthly? Well, he uses one of his finance companies. They send him the payment, and you get your jewelry, all right? It's that easy. Also, if you're low on cash and you need some money, they're also offering up to 5K loans, okay, with no credit check. And you have three months to pay it back, all right? Zero percent interest. There's no loan in the world that does that. No credit check, three months to pay it back at zero percent interest, up to $5,000, all right? So if you have any further questions about jewelry or cash loans, please reach out to him on Instagram. That's d.leodejeweler. That is d.leodejeweler. All right, here we go. So prepare for blast off and embark on an interdimensional journey of self-discovery and exploration like never before. Introducing the exclusive Rick and Morty Interdimensional Gummies, your passport to inner realms of consciousness. Unlock your mind's eye and allow your senses to finally come alive without the strings that strain our perception of the world, right? With Rick and Morty Gummies, you can experience all of that and more. Make sure you give these dudes a follow on IG, at Rick and Morty Gummies Official, and tap in with their telegram for more info. Link is in their bio. Um, check it out, check it out. We got Droopy right here. Rick and Morty gummies, baby. He's on the phone. He's on the phone. I thought he was taking a shit. Nah. <laughs> so Hoodstocks is also brought to you by Dynasty Me. Dynasty Me is a podcast that we love and support. So please go on YouTube and hit that subscribe button. Shout out to Matt Monahue. Hope you're doing well, brother. So businesses, check this out. If you need stickers to promote your brand, well, here's our sticker plug, right? Graphic Joe is our guy. Nothing but quality and they are construction hard hat certified, all right? Contact Graphic Joe at graphicjoe1376 at gmail.com. Graphicjoe1376 at gmail.com. You could also hit him up on Instagram at graphicjoe underscore, all right? Get all your sticker needs from our guy, Graphic Joe, all right? Hoodstocks is also brought to you by Lux Tattoos, the best black and gray work in the city, all right? Place your appointment now. You can hit them up on Instagram at L-U-X underscore tattoos, right? At L-U-X underscore tattoos, right? We got a new sponsor, guys. I got to prep this one, though, a little bit, okay? So hold on. Bear with me. 
All right, all right, all right. So here's a little story about our next sponsor, right? Check this out right here. Check this out. Maybe I'll hold it right here. So check this. Look at this hot sauce right here, all right? So this is the story for for this, right? My name is Sophia, and, I'm a, and I am Korean and Chinese. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, a food capital. I moved to Dime Bar with my husband five years ago. Shout out to Dime Bar. And solid Mexi Mexican food was hard to find. Yep, yep. That is definitely true. Um, I missed LA, especially the fire tacos and burritos. I realized all you needed was some bomb hot sauce or red sauce with any tacos. All you need is this sauce. With 15 years of experience, I tried making the red sauce for fun and it turned into a business idea. King Taco was my inspiration. Okay. So I named my sauce Queen Cali. You can find this hot sauce on their IG at Queen Cali dot red sauce at queen cali dot red sauce or go to their website queen cali sauce dot co all right you could order through their website and use the promo code hood 15 for a 15 percent discount all right i'm gonna try this right here all right guys we're gonna see if it tastes similar or has the inspiration from king taco i can tell you there's no mexican well there's mexican food now in diamond bar but never was you have to go to pomona to get it so I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try dropping some of these Fritos right here. All right. Let's see. Oh. And it's thick too, dog. Yeah, it is it's thick. thick. It's yeah. thick. It's not no. It's not no watered down stuff, bro. <laughs> okay. That's pretty good. Let me see what the ingredients are right here. Ingredients: water, chicken bouillon, lemon juice, vinegar, dried chilies, onions, adobo pepper, spices, garlic powder. Hmm. Yeah, it definitely has flavor with these Fritos. It's all right, you guys can keep going. I'm just gonna keep. Uh, honestly, I th these out. honestly, I think it's 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 mm. salsa, hot sauce that I have never tasted before. It has a very uh, distinct flavor that is good to the fucking palate, bro. No, it really that, is. That is my favorite, Yo, Frankie. I want you to take, take that with home. you too. Yeah, Frankie, take that with you and try that out, bro. She's she's um, a Korean chef. Okay. She's a Korean chef. She moved to Diamond Bar, bro. Shout out to Diamond Bar, because baby. She was go. like she grew, she was raised in L.A. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, it's the capital of fucking tacos and everything right. else, right? You know, and. Um, Bro, that is bomb. Matter of fact, let's do this real quick before I finish my story that I was uh, that I was telling Frankie right now. Um, Frankie, I got gifts for you, baby. That's for you. A hoodie, a t-shirt. Yeah, doggy. Um, and I got books. I got books for you, bro. I got books. The books that you potentially might have read. Um, and, and, and you got, and it's, it, you know what? I have, bro, yeah, stickers for you, brother. I have a library of books. I am big on books right now. I'm, I've taken time off from work just to do the podcast and be a good daddy and a, and a husband to my wifey. But we got, uh, you guys can all get these at uh, www.50racks.com. Half the price of Amazon. Don't play with it. Shout out to my Asian partners that hooked me up. That's 48 Laws of Power. This is 33 Strategies of War. This is mastery. This is seduction. You know, if you know, sometimes baby, after being with baby for so long, bro, she started holding out. So you got to read that book and just hit it with some other shit. You know what I mean? And then, of course, the great Jordan B. Peterson, 12 Rules for Life. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, let me get you right here. I'm sorry, dog. I got you. Yeah. You got me. You got me locked out. Yeah. Hey, brother, can you guys grab Thank that you, and get that off the table for him? But that, those are gifts that I have for you, you brother. Know, I, I, got to, I have to admit to you, lucky that. Um, about, I don't know, two hours before coming on, I went to my local li uh, bookstore to find you a book, bro. So my idea was to, you know, comb the aisles and find the book that was going to be for you. But I was there for a little bit too long, couldn't find it. I actually looked at uh, Father Boyle's uh, books from Homeboy Industries. And one of my all-time favorite books, The Four Agreements, came up. I'm like, you know what? Let me get the guy a bottle of wine instead. So thank you, you know. baby. I love wine too. You see, I got wine glasses and wine right there, brother. Yes. As a matter of fact, I might I might have a glass of that in a minute. Um, <laughs> but so hey, hey, so check, check Frankie, my G, my boy, big dog, What's up, running man? for Congress, all that good stuff, assembly, right? State assembly. State assembly. Don't play with it. You know what I mean? My 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 uh, uh, my education within the political system is minimal. Um, but uh, yes, um, I'm I'm trying to grow that as well you know i mean knowledge uh, retaining the knowledge and understanding the way everything really really works you know which is complicated right oh, yeah 
Um, but so anyways, it's this dude, right? This black CEO always told me what's up. You know what I mean? You know, he's fucking all the bitches. You know what I mean? And this, that. And, and every time, bro, that he would see me, never missed. Mm. He would he would pick me out the crowd of, of, of fellas, of homies. Because, right, right, right. you know, and he would, he, I don't know. I don't know what it was. You know what I mean? He just... Maybe he had some type of liking. Maybe he's seen a little bit of charisma and spark within myself because I was, you know, I was, I'm, I've always been a somewhat of a outspoken, animated person. You know what I mean? Having fun, talking shit. But you got that charisma too, Lucky. I'm sure he saw you as someone he can he can jive with and you would you would be receptive. And I was, yeah. 100%, 100%. You know what I mean? Especially if there's a, there's a mutual respect uh, putting, uh, putting forward. And I, I don't want to create enemies with the dudes that are right. watching me, my babysitters, you know what I mean? I don't want to piss off my babysitters unless I have to, <laughs> unless the homies make me, you know what I mean? Um, but anyways, right, where there are fucking babysitters, though. Um, and so one day, oh, I have a homegirl, her name's Melody, Melanie Sarceda, Melanie Sarceda, I love That's you, right. girl. Um, old school homegirl. And so I had a female at the time, bro. I had a female at the time. And um, she would tell me that my girl that was taking care of me and visited me on the weekends was cheating on me with one of my enemies. Damn. Yeah. You know? And uh, you know what? I, it is what it is. Mm. It is what it is. And so she would give me this information and there might be some dudes that would be, once they got out, as soon as they got this information, they'd be like, bitch, what the fuck? Thought you loved me. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? I'm not making you no more fucking cards. <laughs> I'm not, you know? But you know what? I, you know, I've always... Uh, I've always big myself up on just being a man about life and understanding what it is, yeah, right? Yep. You know, you know, big dog shit, right? I never told her nothing, mm -hmm. dog. You know what I mean? Because the money orders were on time, you know? And so, <laughs> 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 dirty dog, I know. Um, but So she comes and visits me one time, right? And so when we get to the lunch break, after we get to the morning, we get to the lunch break, and the black CEO that always tells me what's up comes and relieves mm -hmm. the main CEO that's in charge of the visiting room, you know? And so I'm sitting there eating a hot pocket, hot pocket with this cheating ass female that loves me, you know? Or <laughs> <laughs> and um and I'm noticing that the that the, the the brothers, specifically the brothers, are following their ladies out following their ladies to the public side of the bathrooms for the visitors. Mm. You know, this is a low level yard dog. I'm on a pro violation. Okay. And, um, I don't want to turn around and front these dudes off and be like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? And, you know, cause body movement is right, everything, right, right? Right, right? You know, I don't want to do that, you know, but I, I tell the love of my life at the time, <laughs> I said, Hey, look at these motherfuckers right here. They're following the girls out to the bathroom. I said, what's up? Well, I said, would you be down with it? You know? And she and she was a little nervous because she, you know, she's sucking dick and fucking everybody, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> you know? And then she's like, yeah, you know, of course, you know, I'm gonna give you what you want, you know? And so finally, after the third brother that goes, mm. follows, I, I, I said, man, and so I, I I I look at the dude and I said, What's up, fool? You know? And he goes, he goes like this, you know, he he nods his head to me. And so I go to his desk, his station where he's at, this correctional officer, and he, he tells me like this. He goes, you see this paper right here? He goes, you got five minutes. He goes, anything after that is on you, not me. Nice. And he goes, you're next. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit. So I go back and I tell her, we're next. I said, he said for you to go to the bathroom, leave the door unlocked, and I will follow a minute after, you know? And I don't need five minutes, bro, <laughs> to make love to this bitch. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> hey, homie, I went in there and like, ah, ah, you know what I mean? <laughs> Had a fucking mini seizure, dog, you know? And, um, and I was done, you know, I was done, you know, 
and I don't know how you you said something that, that had me share this story, uh, you know, or maybe you didn't. I don't know. I'm super <laughs> random sometimes, brother. You know, but so let, let's let's get let's get back to Frankie. Frankie, Frankie. <laughs> no, I love that story. Yeah, that thank you, Carrillo, baby. You no, know, um, that was a good. Story. You know, the, this, the, you don't know, lie the, to the, him. The, one thing I have learned. Yes, sir. I have learned, and I'll tell you guys right now. I'm gonna put you guys up on a little game right now. The worst dude you can be if you are uh, on the streets and you haven't made it to your next chapter of greatness, right? Uh, walking on the right side of life and doing good for yourself and your family, which is a beautiful fucking thing. And I never thought I'd be on this side because I was so far deep on the other side, you know? Um, what I wanna say, I, I just wanna say this, man. I, I kinda lost my train of thought right now. I'm sorry, you know, but um. I lost my train of thought, dog. Man, yeah, all the good, bloods. Uh... All good, bro. Yeah, I lost. I lost my train of thought, but fuck, I lost my train of thought. I had a point that I wanted to make, but anyways, let's do this, Frankie. Let uh, that happen sometimes, especially sometimes when I'm. I, sometimes I, I get a little nervous on these interviews, bro. You know, when I got when I got a, a Frankie Carrillo right here, bro. You know what I mean? Like a, like bro, you're 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 what you've been through and where you're at now in life, bro is like to me bro it, it's 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 bigger than life bro and it's 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 intimidating almost you know like you are a force to reckon with brother i mean what you're doing now which we'll get into what you're doing now but let's get out of the system of when you got exonerated you know um so you start making noise you said you started making noise you know like yeah yeah um by the way, I'm, that happens to me all the time, man. Train of thought. You know, I, it's embarrassing, I'm to, bro. I'm about to make a, you know, the, 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 you know, you know, make that, make that, make, connect all those dots and say what I was going to say, and then I just, yeah, it just doesn't happen, right? But, hey, uh, it's real time. But I, I, I was, I was, I was. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be funny, but I was going to say something else about. Say it. I was, just, I thought, I thought the reason why you went there was because you went into that bathroom in that prison, in that prison visiting room. And you couldn't perform, bro. But you knocked that. You took care of business, bro. I, I you, took. I, I believe I took care of business the way I was expected to take care of business. Absolutely, bro. You know, and and that was like within unexpected un, uh, under a rushed. minute. Yeah, under a minute. No. <laughs> you only <laughs> no, had five. <laughs> no, but I really had a point that I, I I had a point that I wanted I wanted to make in regards to you know holding the, it down. The no, the fellas that haven't got to the next chapter. You know, uh, I had a I had a good point initially, but you it'll know, it'll come to you, bro. Yeah, it'll it will come to me when I when you I know, think of it. It's it's interesting you say that, bro, because I'll maybe segue before I get to the other part. Yes, sir. About these moments, right? So I must have been about twenty four years old. I guess I was maybe it was in the joint at this point, but I remember like remember I remember it happening that there was like this like chemical release, like it, something had happened to me as a human being that I had that I had. Um, Seen some light, seen some connected some dots, and at the time it kind of scared me because I felt like my my vision became very clear, like something had had a moment had arrived that maybe uh, I, I don't know, just I, I wasn't expecting, I should say. But I, but I'll, I'll you know picking up kind of where you were where you were leaving off, bro. I forgot your point. You're right. There are moments that we as men, we as human beings, should be should be you should be expecting. We should be reminding each other of these moments of of awakening, of greatness, of maturity, and I think that amongst our community, we need to do a better job of that, of reminding our children, ourselves. You know, there's still a lot of life to live. You know, God willing, bro, there's a life that that um, that others have have journeyed. You know, age wise, you know, longer they've been alive longer than us, that they can share with us. I wish there would be someone who was in their 80s who would say, you know, Frankie, you'll be 50 next year. But when you're 60, 65, something's gonna happen. You're gonna be looking at life a little bit differently. Yeah. And I wish that these these benchmark moments would be more would be more vocalized, like they're happening here with us. Versus, I can read about it all day long. But as a as a guy who's maybe in a position of being a, a, an elder or being someone with some lived experience about life, can can understand the importance of passing that down. You know. A hundred percent, bro. Yeah. I'm I I am, bro. I am a. I'm somewhat of a I'm somewhat of a drill officer at the house, mm. not a pro officer. <laughs> more my kids. I told how many kids I, by the way? 
give me give me the well at my house i have a seven and eight year old two girls seven eight years old they they, they call them the irish twins okay. right when they're that close in age and then i have a stepdaughter that's 16 which is man we we are just and she, her father is in her life you know what i mean and sometimes we uh she's had a hard time with me because mom mom's is my my girl is very lenient, very relaxed. She is 100% the opposite of me, sweetest person in the world. Not saying that I'm a bad person, but accountability. I hold my kids very uh, accountable. And I was telling my 16 year old today because already my seven, eight year olds are already performing at a level where they're holding their own within the household. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about holding their own within the household, hey, nobody in this house lives here for free. Everybody is responsible for something. I, and I told my sister, I said, I don't live here for free. Mom don't live here for free. And now your sister, seven, at the ripe age of seven, eight years old, you know what? They don't live here for free because they have responsibilities, you know? And when we're talking about not living free, I'm not talking about take, uh, paying a bill. I'm talking about, hey, clean your room, mm -hmm. pick up your mess. We got to wash dishes. We got to wash dishes. I don't care if it's not your mess. Right. You know? And, and you know, we, we as a family... We sometimes we might have to clean the, the our siblings' mess. I might my girl has to clean all of our mess. Sometimes I have to clean the kids' mess. You know what I mean? But I, we all have our responsi responsibilities. So within my household, I I put pressure on the people underneath my roof to be accountable and 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 not have not necessarily keeping a foot on their neck, but just like. You know, the only way we're going to raise up is, is just handling business, you know, being responsible, doing what we have to do to as a unit to make life easier for all of us, yeah. you know. Um, but anyways, I mean, how are you as a father? I know we're kind of jumping forward a little bit, but how are you with a father with your young ones? You know, I mean, I'm going to give myself and I mean, obviously you know, hearing you talk about your, you know, your father, you know, father as well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give myself some credit too, bro, that, you know, I'm a good dad. I'm a dad who's, uh, you know, very loving. I, I don't wanna be my kid's friend. I think I, I'll start off by saying that. Is I that got, the worst thing you can do to your, your kid, be their friend? No, I just, I don't, I'm just saying it just as, just as like a, you know, precursor to what I'm gonna say next. Like, I'm like, I'm their dad. Yeah. Like they got one, they can have a lot of friends in, the, in, in on, you know, in life and, as stages in their life and so on, but they, they're gonna have me. And so I don't, you know, my, 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 my 10 year old is, is, is super short, man. He's, he's, his IQ, his EQ especially is, uh, you know, off the chart. And he's very like emotionally intelligent. He can, he's super smart. He's, he's, he's very present. And his little sister mimics him. She's, she's gonna be, you know, forced to be reckoned with as well. But I have to remind myself that sometimes I see some patterns from when I was a kid. Yeah. And the pattern is this, is that when, a, when adults are observing a kid come of age and they see that, oh, they're smart. Oh, they, 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 um, they got it figured out. The parent may, may pull back and like, oh, okay, they, they know what they're doing. And I think that's a big mistake. So, I'm, I'm, so I think in my life, I've always gave the impression that I was older than I was or I was more confident that I should have been, or I was more eager to just try something out or whatever. And I see my 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 ten year old causing me to respond that way, causing me to feel like, oh, um, he's 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 mature for his age. He can do things that are out that are beyond his age bracket. And I have to remind him while he's holding his little teddy bear because he still likes the teddy bears <laughs> that he is he he's gonna have a little amount of of childhood. In a whole lot of life, so like, let's let's hold that childhood precious, and let's not try to rush into adulthood. Ah, that's good advice for me, bro. You know, because I'll tell you, bro, is that um, yeah. you know, his mom and I, you know, have gone through a divorce. So amazing, um, these are two different households here, and you know, I gotta be careful because there can be a lot of uh, emotional triggering here. Like oh, when they're with me, I make sure that they're happier, or they're, you know, they got what they want or whatever. But I I can't I can't play that. I gotta make sure that there's a balance there where. They don't see dad as like the fun dad and mom as, or vice versa, right? So there's a lot of moving parts that as the adult, you know, I'm put, putting a lot of pressure on myself as an adult or as a parent that I have to just be, I have to be on top of it. How, how about your, your child 
uh, would your ch- would your child be in a th- his or th- her thirties now? The first your first child? He's thirty two. So He's, Theo is thirty two years old. Yeah. yeah, Theo. There you go. How how is your relationship with Theo? You know, I, I would be lying to you, Lucky, if I said it was great. You know, okay. I th- it's pretty fractured. You know, my son, I love my, my son. You know, he's uh, he's a young man who's who's in his early 30s. He'll be 33 this year. And, um, you know, I, I you know it's not to, it's not to bail him out, but I think, you know, what, what happened to me also happened to him. Fuck. You know, and, and I think that, you know, um, you know, I, I didn't know this initially, but... But as time went on on the inside, he became like this anchor. He became this like the hope that like there's a, there's a, a little boy out there uh, who doesn't have a dad, and I'm the dad. I, I need to be out there with him. And so my dream was, you know, I would write him a letter every week. He got to eat. I'm sure I don't know where those letters are. If he still has them, threw them away. But for about the last 15 years, he got a letter every week for, you know, till I got out. And I was under the impression that when I came home, that we would be like best buddies. Father and son reunite, and you know we're gonna be hanging out all the time and so on, and that's just not what happened, you know. And um, I don't fault him or fault myself. It's just that he didn't know me and I didn't know him. But um, all that to say is that you know every day is a new chance to bond and and be closer. So you know I drop him his text message and I'll give him a voice voicemail or whatever. And but he's a he's a great young man. I'm really proud of him. So I, you asked me about how many kids I have. I told you the kid, the, the two kids that I have in my new chapter in life with my girl, right? Shout, and shout out to you, love. I love you so much. Shout out to my girl, you know what I mean? She just, she lets me be me and she lets me do my thing, you know what I mean? And she's not like, she don't give a fuck about no social media. She don't give a fuck about no nothing. I mean, she is a very reserved, uh, quiet person, you know what I mean? Um, sweetest person you ever meet. And uh, that helps me be able to do what I do at this point in my life and just, you know, be me. You know, she lets me be me. But I have, uh, you know, mind you, uh, five, six times in and out of the prison system, I seem to get a female pregnant every time. So I have other kids, grown kids, you know, and we talked about, you talked about a fractured relationship and what we went through, they went through, you know what I mean? And and it's unfortunate and i've i've made attempts multiple attempts you know um you know i i heard cat williams the cat williams has a viral interview he did with shannon sharp and he he was just talking about uh kids that he adopted and they were you know, shannon sharp asked him uh, i forget what, what exact question he asked him but shannon sharp basically said that once they are 18 i mean that's and I don't. Uh, Cat Williams said, once they're eighteen, they're 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 gone. They're going to do what they're going to do, and whatever's instilled in them is instilled with them. And I don't know if that's necessarily or true or not. I mean, because we've changed, right, as grown men, right? But it just seems like it's been really hard for me to to repair what I have done with my other kids, which are adults now. You know, I mean, I'm forty six years old. You know. And um, it's just, uh, and I've really tried, and I've I've gotten emotional, and I've you know, and maybe you know, with myself, uh, you know. But fuck me, it ain't about me; it's about them, you know. But it's just me being down on fuck fucking up when you finally you get to a point in your life where you realized all the mistakes that you made and how much of a fucking idiot you are, you know. And not only were you destroying your fucking life, but you took everything else down with you that was along the path, right? You know, and, um, you know, it's it's just, it's really unfortunate. Like my son, my oldest son, he's in the prison system now, bro, you know, and it's just, uh, it, it's, um, it's repercussions, bro, innocent bystanders, you know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, uh, stray bullets, you know, um, and it's just, it's, it's fucking horrible, bro. You know, it's horrible, you know what I mean? And and what, what my mistakes is history going to repeat itself, you know what I mean? Uh, it seems like it is, bro, you know? And it's just, uh, you know, I just don't know. I don't know what to do, you know? And, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm just forever trying to learn and grow. And hopefully, the, you know, these kids that are brought into the world, man, I, you know, I don't know, dog. It's tough, man. It's tough, bro. Yeah, it's tough, but let's let's get back on track, you know, um, of you getting exonerated, you making noise, 
you getting that appeal back that had the big denied stamp on it, you know, and you started really, really up in your game. You you started having you. I mean, you raised eighty thousand dollars, bro, on a GoFundMe to help because you need money to get out of there, right? Well, there you know, is pro, pro yeah. bono people, right? Well, but, you know, early on, I thought that that was the move, right? I needed money because you know. I need to hire somebody. So if you need to hire somebody, you need some money. So um, this was just kind of like, you know, pre GoFundMe. So just like making calls and, you know, word of mouth kind of thing, right? Yeah. But um, didn't pan out. You know, hired the wrong people. Money was wasted and so on. So, you know, as life went on, there was, you know, Oprah Winfrey got the letter. Um, wow. You know, 48 hours got the, every everyone who I can who I can think of who had anything to do with like doing the right thing. Had a platform to make the noise and you know, put the spotlight yeah, on your I mean, situation, right? Yeah, so like they got they got the, the letter, right? And I think as time went on, the letters got better. So from early on, um, you know, again, very maybe emotionally, no, no substance, but as life went on, it got better. But I'll fast forward now to um, Folsom Prison. So I'm at Folsom Prison and I'm a teacher's aide. And my my uh, my boss Tony Carter, the, the teacher I was working for, would uh, lets me know that she was going to retire. She'd been down for twenty years there working, so she's she's done. And as her teacher's assistant or teacher's aide, she tells me, "Hey Frankie, like I'm um, you know maybe just giving you a heads up. You have to find a new job." So you know, thanked her for it. And that that night, the night that was a Monday, that night I, I went to you know. Routine went back to my cell, went to bed, and I woke up the next morning with this like very urgent feeling, this dream. I, you know, been it wasn't the dream didn't have any any visuals. It just had this like tell her, ask her to help you, which is all I, all I can remember. Yeah. And I guess that meant like ask Tony. So Tony knew my story, bro. She knew what I had been going through. She had you know proofread my letters and so on, but I had never asked her directly. But now that she was leaving. I said, so, you know, anyway, fast forward, Friday gets around and she's leaving, bro. Give her a hug. And as she's leaving, I just ask her, you know, Tony, would you do me a favor? She says, yeah. I said, you know, Tony, you know what I've been going through for all these years. Um, you know, if you get a chance to come across a lawyer or a reporter or anyone you think can help me, would you do me a favor and just share my story? And she says, yeah, I can do that. And so I felt very confident and lucky because... Up until that point, I was writing letters. I was potentially maybe a phone call, but I wasn't asking someone face to face. And so this was my first sort of face to face moment. And she said, "Yeah, I can do that." So I felt very confident. Um, that's you know, let's see what happens next, right? So what happened next was going to change my life. So about six months after that conversation, Tony's now retired. She's living in, in uh, Sacramento area. She gets invited to a um, it's like a, an event. It was a, an author in town who was in who wrote a book called "We're All Doing Time," Bo Lozoff, and he was going to be there to you know meet and greet and share the book and so on, right? And so Tony tells me that she had she had met the guy, she had read the book. For her, it was just she was going to show up because she had some she had some time on you know some free time on her hands, and so she shows up, and sure enough, you know a bunch of people were there. And during the Q and A, there was a woman in the room who says. You know, my name is Ellen Eggers. I'm an attorney, you know, here in Sacramento. By the way, Bo Lozoff, and she asked some some random question about why they were actually there. But to my credit, she announced that she was a lawyer. And then Tony was like, "Oh, lawyer? Maybe this is maybe this is the one." So she remembered my my request. And so at some point, the teacher, conf- you know, meets the lawyer, and says, "Hey, there's a my." Teachers, I used to be a uh, retired teacher at Folsom Prison. My teacher's aide, Frankie Carrillo, I believe he's innocent when you look into his case. And the rest is basically history. About a week later, Ellen Eggers, the attorney, came to Folsom to visit me, just a random visit. And um, she then acquired the assistance of the Innocence Project at, out of Northern California Innocence Project and an international law firm by the name of Morrison and Forster. So now we had a we had a, a you know, international law firm, the, the, the Innocence Project, and these attorneys, Ellen Eggers, who for the next five years 
investigated the case, and the case basically yielded all the evidence that we needed. And basically what got me out was that these witnesses who lied, Scotty and the other guys, they recanted. So they all came back full, you know, many years later saying what had actually happened. And so that was the new evidence. And, and what actually happened? What actually happened, lucky was that they, the, crime, the crime occurred, as they said it occurred, but them as witnesses, they, they didn't see what had happened. They heard a gunshot, they hit the ground, they heard a gunshot, they weren't even looking at the direction of the car. So there was, there was, no, there was no leads, there was nothing to go on. And so that's when the cops come in and, and, and fabricate testimony. And they got to the point, this is, this is what was so, so, not even troubling, but just like laughable. So there was six witnesses who testified against me. And it turns out that one of the witnesses wasn't even at the crime scene. Some looky loo who came after the fact, and he knew the guys, and he he picked up a little bit of information about what had happened. That when they asked, I guess, like, "Hey, who uh, who knows what happened?" He he said he raised his hand, and said, "Oh, I know what happened. The car went by, or whatever." And all these years later, it turns out the guy was in his house watching TV with his mom, and um, and that guy somehow lied to the cops or maybe was brought into the bigger's lie here and became a star witness along with Scotty and everybody else. And so it's it's kind of hard to believe, but it's it's what happened, you know. And so did they if I remember right with the Netflix special, did they redo the whole crime scene on the street? They did, yeah, they reenacted it. They reenacted it. There yep. you go. Yeah, they reenacted. So Judge Pachacalupo, who was a good friend of mine now, he was the judge at this final hearing, and he allowed it. You know, my attorneys asked if they would do it. And what happened was they got an expert, this guy named um, Scott Frazier. He's a he's a uh, like a, a light light expert. So he was going to determine that, you know, at that time, on that day, the you know the moon, the, the whatever, the darkness. You could even, even you know, he was going to give you a scientific breakdown that there was no way that the eye is capable of making an identification because it was so dark and, and because it was so far away. And so I guess the judge wanted to put that theory to the test, and so they went and they reenacted the crime in front of the house where it happened. Is that something that happens? I mean, how many times does that happen where, there, where a case is brought back up for an appeal and they can actually, I mean, I believe they had jurors out there. They, I mean, they had a, did they have jurors? They had a number of people out there to witness this reenactment. Is that correct? Yeah. So there was the, the final hearing was just a judge. It was going to be based on what he, what he determines. But the people who were out there was, I'm sure there was a, a litany of sheriff deputies protecting the judge. The sheriff's deputies were at the center of all this. So they were out there too. Uh, the DA's office was out there. My attorneys were out there. And so I'm sure it's a, a big cast of characters observing this reenactment go down. Is that is that something that n- normally happens? How many other times does that happen? I, I think it's rare. Yeah, they rare. said it was r- rare for that to happen. I think a judge has to be, the, I think a judge has to, you know, I don't know, just take his, his or her job very seriously. And if someone says, hey, Your Honor, it might be, it might be a good idea for you to kind of put your eyes on sort of experiences as a human being to see what this testimony is. Um, We have an opportunity to do it, um, to recreate it, because apparently the conditions that night that happened, you know, 20 years prior were pretty similar to that night of the, of the reenactment. So it was, it was perfect. Wow. Wow. And so while this is going on, you know, this is going on, and you are in a cell knowing this is going on. What are your thoughts? Mm. You know, bro, I was brought down from, from Folsom. You know, I, I knew it. I mean, they, the case was, was going through the motions and, um, you know, took that long bus drive on a, on, a, on a Friday and got back to the county jail and they slammed me down. You know, they got me in high power and, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, 
know, all, all the chains they can put on me. They, you know, because it's you know I'm going, I'm accusing the sheriffs of doing of a wrongdoing. Yeah. So I'm being brought back to their to their dungeon, basically, or their or their headquarters. Jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is the, you know they run the county jail, so they they're making life a little bit complicated for me, but it's okay. Um, but I'm I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the next day to come back. So, the the following day after the reenactment, because it happened at night, um, they kind of. The judge in open court kind of explains what he saw and what what happened. So it was, um, I think it was courageous. It was a, it was a strong move from the judge because he could have he could have easily said like, nah, no, no need. I'll take the the witness's testimony as suffice and move on. But he said, nah, let's let's get into it. Let's 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 set the record straight yeah. in a real way. Wow, and so. Once they do that, they re, they do the reenactment, re, reenactment, reenactment. Thank you, sir. Um, what what is the next step? Do you go back into the courtroom, and uh, there's a, a a new finding, a new of guilty or not guilty? How how does that play out? You know what, what was trippy, lucky was that, you know my my attorneys my attorneys. Um, Everyone was pumped up. I mean, obviously, I was pumped up. I've been waiting for this day for 20 years, right? Yeah. So we're back for this habeas hearing, habeas corpus hearing. And I get to the I get to the Compton courthouse where it all went wrong, and now I'm hoping it's all going to go right. Yeah. And I'm in my, my blues, and they got me all, you know, bring me up from the basement. I'm on the whatever floor we were on. And the, and the deputy tells me, Deputy Lacey says, um, your attorneys have some clothes for you. You know, they have a suit, jacket, and some pants, and some shoes, or whatever. And I said, I'm not going to wear it. Like, I'm cool. And so she was really adamant that, like, she's just a messenger. So she went and got the lawyers and said, hey, like, he doesn't want to put the clothes on. And so they all came back and said, like, look, we're trying to impress the judge. You know, put on some, put, put the suit on when we bought you. And, like, this, these are kind of the motions, frankly, that we have to go through to get you as as presentable as possible. And I pushed back, man. I said, look, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be free by putting on these clothes. The judge knows why we're here. We're not here asking for, for a favor. We're not here asking for pity. We're here asking for justice. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Shit. And as, as hard as it was for me to push back on my attorneys, lucky I'm glad that I did, because I walked in like, look, man, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Like I've been, I've been, I've been suffering, man, and I'm here, and I want what's what what I have coming to me, and I I think if my mindset would have been in there thinking anything else, then who knows what would have happened, right? But I just felt it was very divine that. Again, about the the moon and the stars and everything else aligned, man. And I was back in court, and I and I realized, bro, that you know I, I had a there was other breakthroughs that needed to happen long before I got there, which was like I, I needed to value myself. I needed to say like, look, man, you, you know, there's only one life to live. Am I gonna rot here and accept their their outcome, which was? He'll go to prison. That system will eat him up. He'll lose hope in, in himself, and and he'll lose hope in, in the desire to fight. And he'll get, you know, he'll start doing what what the other guys are doing, and then he'll just like we'll never hear from him again, because that was the plan, for Frankie Carrillo to never be seen or heard from ever again. Whew. That's the that was the plan. And so by the time we're doing this reenactment, uh, is uh, the, the Vikings, you know what I mean? Are, the, are the, we, There's obviously a, a change within the police. Uh, I mean, do we still have these same uh, police officers present? So what happened, so at the time of, of my, my hearing, Lee Baca was the top sheriff. Yeah. And Paul Tanaka was number two. Paul Tanaka was a Linwood Viking. He's a guy who was... He was the sergeant that was conducting the raid on my pad. So he, he's part of my story from when he was a, a young sh- uh, sheriff um, sergeant, you know, 20 years prior. So now he's moved to the ranks and became the number two guy. So I'm sure when he heard uh, 
wrongful conviction of the Linwood, a case that he was um, associated with because of that's the that's the, the department he ran, the OSS, you know, the Operation Safe Streets. You know, this is something that he was not trying to uh, embrace. So these dudes were trying to do everything in their power to make sure that I would stay in prison. Wow. No matter what the evidence was proven. So I'll tell you, Lucky, is that, and the Netflix touches on it, but the reality was that even today, law enforcement are the investigators and the DA is are the attorneys. And they work hand in hand. You know, if there's a good investigation, they might proceed with the case and then it goes on to the system, right? My attorneys realized that once, once it was clear that the evidence was going to prove to my innocence, they said, well, we need to talk to the DA's office. This is not a case about, you know, again, favors. This is like, look, we, we can prove to you that he's innocent. And so they did. They convinced him. And, and the DA was going to do a, a joint filing, which is, at the time was, was unheard of, which is going to, they were going to basically say, we agree that uh, Frankie's attorneys have have discovered and have proven that Frankie is innocent. And we're going to together go to the court and say, Your Honor, let this man go. <sighs> Sounded good for the book, right? Yeah. Until someone said, has anybody notified the Sheriff's Department? <laughs> and they said, well, we haven't. And when they did, all hell broke loose. Wow. You know, and it's, it's, um, it's unfortunate. You know, a lot, is, a lot is, has changed, a lot hasn't, but that's some of the elements of my case. Wow, bro. But before we talk about the release right now, I'm going to hand over to Casey because I have to take a pee break real yeah, quick, go brother. For it, brother. Yeah. Here we go. I got some questions for you, actually. The first question is Do you still play handball? <laughs> you know what? I, I do, man. Um, I, it's, um, I was an avid handball player on the inside, and um, I actually own a, own a big property in the northern part of LA County, and I have a my own personal handball court, so it's uh, it's that serious of a game for me, man. I love nice. I love the sport. Yeah, damn, that's amazing. Um, another question I have: uh, well, you talked about um, complacency, and how is complacency an ambition killer? You know, Casey, when I was in, uh, I happened to be at the at the time the the a luxury prison, which was Donovan State Prison in San Diego. I you know, just got lucky and they sent me there for a couple of years. And when I got there, I started doing what everybody else was doing, was just enjoying the, the visits and the weather. And they had some cool hobbies there. And, you know, the, the, the atmosphere was really nice. And I realized that I needed to get the hell out of here because this was going to just, I, I, I noticed it um, sucking any desire to get out. It was it was it was having the the, uh, the effect that I, I was not expecting, but that I found myself now thinking, oh, like I'll get around to my wrongful conviction tomorrow. Like I'm I'm gonna go I'm gonna go um, to the hobby shop and do some some leather work or something. It was just a lot of distractions, and I was getting complacent. I was fortunately getting complacent because my family lived nearby and so on. And so I asked to go to Folsom. At the time, Folsom was a level two, and that was a, a close custody. My, my, I could only go there, basically. And they said, are you sure you want to go? I go, yeah, I'm sure. They said, it's a mistake, but like, if you want, we'll put you up. And so they did. And uh, lo and behold, they, they shipped me there. And even though it was the worst place I had ever been, it's what I needed. I needed to have that, that um, all those comforts or all those... those um, those makeshift sort of like um, uh, distractions go away, and so they definitely did at Folsom. So, when, it was, so it was like an eye opening, something like that. It was like an eye opening for you, like like you were getting used to it over there, and and Donovan more like, okay, I can deal with this instead of like, I need to try to get back to the pad type deal. You know, bro, I was getting visits on a regular basis at Donovan, and I was getting, you know, there was it, it just. It just got too comfortable, it's yeah. too comfortable, and I felt that, I felt that. Um, to to Casey's original question, like I was just like losing focus on what I sh what my focus should have been on, which is like Going fighting, home. making that noise I was talking about, right, or maybe f seeking that help, and um, and so I needed to kind of get myself out of that environment. So it was tough, but I I'm grateful that I did. And when you're at Folsom, can you tell us about who the Halloween was? 
The who is? <laughs> the, <laughs> Elo, the Elomine? Oh, yeah. El Elomine, yeah. Elomine was... Um, so when I got to Folsom, there was... Um, uh, Nation of Islam, their their top guy was uh, was Elamine, was his, what they, he went by. His real name was Wendell James, that I later, I later learned. But somebody, a partner of mine said, hey, you need to talk to Elamine. Elamine is the guy that, that can help you. And that was in my, I suppose, maybe mid-20s. And Elamine was in his maybe late 50s, maybe pushing 60. And at the time, Elamine ran with the crew. He had guys flanking him. He was like the, the top dog, you know. And very respectful gentleman out of the Bay Area. I think he was out of San Francisco or Oakland. And Elamine um, had heard that I was gonna, you know, I'm looking for him. He's looking for me, kind of thing, right? And he, on the on one of the the yard recalls, Elamine stops his little caravan and and during the movement, and he comes over and gives me a big embrace, and he. Um, kind of caught me off guard you know I'm a young I'm a young you know Chican from LA and here's this this group of black guys giving me this big hug and you know I'm, I'm wondering who's watching or what they're going to say about that or whatever and nothing came about it you know I, I shook his hand and we said we'll talk later but El Amin um, was a man who instilled all that he had learned because he was also wrongfully convicted all that he had acquired and he had he had passed it down to me and the reason why that story is so vital for me, Casey, is because if at if at, if at that young age, I had I had befallen to don't talk to the blacks, you can only talk to the to the fellas or or to the gavachos, or then I would have never embraced this man who who, have, who really gave me the map to get out. You know, he gave me another piece to the puzzle, and I and I say it because I'm grateful that. You know the hostilities that were going on, or the or the do's and don't do's of that world, ha hadn't sunk in, it hadn't hadn't blinded me to to that. And so I'm grateful that, you know, you can still be in that world, but you know, when an opportunity like that came, I'm grateful that I didn't I didn't reject it because Elamine happened to be a black man. Mm. That's crazy. The architect. I'm getting a lot of good text messages about this right now. So shout out to Sarafine. A lot, of, a lot of the brothers are tapping in right now. He's a just, good man, bro. Yeah, a lot of the brothers man. right now. I just looked at my text message right now, and all the brothers are just tapping in and just, they're loving what we, they're loving our collaboration right here and what we're doing in your story, obviously. And I mean, this is just uh, one for the books, 1,000%. So they do the reenactment. Um, and then how, what, what, what is the, you, you go to court now, like, you know, that you're not going to put the suit on. You know, and that's just that's just different, bro. Because you're, you're, you're still. I mean, the level of vulnerability and just what you've been through, bro. You were just at a point of just like, like you're not fucking with me right now with this fucking suit. Yeah. You know, you're not fucking with me with to make me feel. I haven't been in street clothes and. 20 years you're not you're not playing with my emotions more than you already have ruined 20 years of my fucking life prime fucking years you know excuse my language brother but it's the only way that i can express it because i feel it in a I, I feel it from my heart when i hear you share your story you know um you know when you stood your stance on it i mean i probably would have put the suit on i mean a lot of people think about it it's a weird thing like would you put the suit on you know I probably would have put the bow tie on. I would have danced like a little monkey, <laughs> clapped the motherfucking thing, you know what I mean? Shit, get me the fuck out this bitch, you know? Whatever you think I need to do, you know? But you knew in your heart. I pushed back. What it was, you know? And we pushed back, man. Push, I just, yeah, bro. I just, push I, back. Yeah, bro. I, you, know, you know, lucky I felt that... Um, you know, I'd been, I'd been saying, you know, thank God, or, you know, I mentioned other folks' religion or my own or whatever, but like... What is your religion? I'm sorry. You know, bro, I don't... I don't... I don't bang, I guess, right? But I don't... <laughs> I don't I don't, I don't... Um, you know, bro, I don't... I, You know, I, th I think the experience is that I was raised Catholic. Okay. And, and you go into a world where you confront men, in this case, it's, it's a, you know, male institutions that are from all parts of, of, of the world believe in what they believe in from Buddhism to Islam to um, you know, 
Asian, other Asian religions, other forms of, of Christianity, Judaism. And so you start realizing that this is, this is, it's another form of us versus them. And I, you know, and I, and I wasn't really a, a practicing Catholic to begin with. Yeah. That I, I was sort of just like, you know what, hey, this is to all the gods. This is to, I mean, anyone who's listening, just I just, just same text, <laughs> exactly, same text. Anybody, man, yeah, I'm, group you know, message, bitch. <laughs> exactly, bro. So it was, you know, so you know, but I, you know, I'm gonna, I guess I can say like I'm more spiritual than than what you know, religious. But I believe, I, I, I think there is definitely, um, I respect everybody's belief, bro. And I know some people need it more than others, and some, you know, I know I've needed it many times in my life to just be grounded and hear those messages. And there's a lot of great stories and, and everybody's history, bro. And I think at the end of the day, it's about love and finding uh, peace, if we yeah. can find that within ourselves, and obviously. And wherever you find it at, right? Yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. whatever, you know, uh, whatever whatever entity uh, you, you find it, right? You know what I mean? Um, so you go into the courtroom without the suit. Is this the day... It was a, it was a a, a six day hearing, basically a trial by judge. Six day hearing. Break that a little bit down to me. So uh, why it would be why it would take six days to get to yep. the truth of the matter? So it took it took a week, and then and then that Monday again. So it started on a Monday, and it came back on a Monday. So what happens is, of course, the court doesn't open on, you know, it opens when it opens, and so they start when they start. But they had what what's trippy. I'll say it this way, bro. There was a 20 year class reunion that was going down right in front of my eyes. So everybody was back. <laughs> the DA was back, the cops were back, the witnesses were back, I was back. How old are you at this time? 37. 37. And what, what I couldn't believe, bro, and there I was, I was flanked. I mean, I, I started the story with the dude, Robin Yeans, with his lone, lone wolf, this attorney, right? I'm back 20 years later with I think I had 15 attorneys in the courtroom, but there were secretaries and there were people carrying boxes. And, you know, so it was definitely, it was definitely, a, you know, it was Fuck different. Fucking dream team, baby. It was different, bro. Yeah. It was different. And what was going on was that this was a, a class reunion, 20 year class reunion, because what happened was that these boys who were now men, one by one, were going on the stand and saying their name and the, the questions were basically, you know, you know, tell us about yourself. You know, married, I got kids, I work for, for whatever they work for. You know, I, I, my hobbies, I like to travel. And then they get, into the, they get into the testimony. And then the next one would say whatever they're doing. So the guy who's at the defense table all shackled up is thinking, damn, if they ask me the same question, what am I going to say? Which is nothing. I just been I've been waiting. Ooh. Yeah, I've been waiting for you motherfuckers to grow <laughs> up and get it right. You know, bro, it's it's trippy because like, like the one of the dudes, one of the dudes who was now from a boy to a man was the victim's son, Damien. And I, you know, I give credit. I give credit to all those witnesses who came forward, you know, twenty years later and did the right thing, because what they did, what they did, lucky was. They they admitted that they had lied, and then they told the truth. Bro, we've we've all been in that moment of like, okay, here's your moment to tell the truth. What are you talking about? And you, you hold that line, right? Like I, I didn't do what what. As a kid, as an adult, at some point in your life, we know what that feels like. This is this is magnified on some other level, because your your lie sent someone to prison for the rest of their lives. This is not just some like white lie, or you're just you know there was no there was no repercussions that caused anything. Nobody got harmed. This is ex this is on another level. So for them to be like, you know what, I lied, and I'm gonna tell you what happened. I mean, I think these are the these are the ones who deserve a lot of the credit, man, for doing that. And when they're doing this, when they're on stand and doing this, what, I mean, how emotional were you getting? How emotional, where, where did that take you emotionally? 
You know, no. bro. Like it's 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 a it's a trippy way I, I think about my life, man. But I'll, I'll I'll preface it by saying this: is that so? They got me slammed down in the jail, the, in the county jail. And on my first that first day of court, they get me up early and they put me on the bus by myself in the, one of those little cages. And then I'm looking. Here comes the chain Compton Court bus or whatever, and it was all black guys. Everybody was black on the bus mm-hmm. except me. And because you're high power, they got you in a, in a non. They don't want you with the with the with the the raza. They want you with another group or whatever. I, I guess that's just their policy. So I get on the bus and they, they fill the bus up and everybody's going to court. And there was a couple guys who just befriended me. They just happened to sit by me and hey, where you? What are you doing? Or where are you from? Whatever. And, and we start talking. And the victim in my case is an African American man, Donald Sarpy, the father, husband, innocent bystander was a, was a black man. And these witnesses were, were men of color as well. And so there was always this like, this um, cultural ca- clash. And here it was again in this, in this, in this final hearing, right? Here are these, these now uh, men who were talking about their lives as, as being just men and the struggles that they've gone through and so on. And every day that I'll get back on that same scenario, or first guy in that in that cage on that bus, and here comes all the guys going to court. And that so those two things paralleled every day as I went to court. And when these and when these guys, these men were coming to the stand and saying that they lied, and that they would they were apologizing to me in open court. <sighs> Frankie, I'm sorry. And then in you know, unscripted, bro. I stand up from, or whatever, the chair is, I'm cuffed to it or whatever, and I'm like, I, I forgive you. I'm just, this is like a, a movie being played out. And, you know, you hear people crying, you know, because there's people in the audience and they're all, you know, everyone's hanging on everybody's words, right? So it's just, it's a lot to take in. It's like as raw as it can be. And, um, and so I commend them, bro. I commend them for, I don't even hold it against them, but, you know, the front end, of course, I had, you know, reservations about how could they do that to me, but to know that um, what was happening with the with the pressure from the law enforcement, what was happening, you know, this 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 young boy's father was murdered in front of him, what pressure he must have had to, to identify somebody, you know, it's not to minimize what happened or what they did was right, because it was obviously wrong, but I'm I don't see them as like I don't see them as as. I see them as victims as well on, on multiple levels. Yeah. That's just a, that's a grown man talking right there, buddy. It's a fucking grown man talking right there. It's, it's grown man conversation. Whew. Damn. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you, lucky, you know, I, I mentioned the, the bus for a reason, man. So on my final day, there was these two guys out of Compton, these two Compton Crip guys who were on trial. So they were on the bus with me every time and they made sure that he sort of sat uh, uh, next to me in my cage. And they were asking me questions about, you know, hey, this is what happened to me in court today. You have any advice and so on, right? So I'm, I'm helping these guys out, whatever I can do, right? And on the final, on the final day, we pull up to the Compton uh, courthouse, and these big iron doors open up, and this bus pulls into this sally port, and they shut the doors behind us, and it gets really dark in there. And one of these two guys that I've been talking to for a week now in a day, he says, um, is there, like, is there, uh, like, everybody, like, basically, like, listen up. You know, he's on the whole bus. And he said, like, is there anybody, like, a preacher on, on the bus? And some guy in the back says, yeah, like, I, you know, whatever. Like, I know God or he, he, he knows about the Bible or something. Yeah. And the guy said, he said, um, Like, I know we're all here for our own problems. Everyone's going to court. Like, everyone's there waiting for whatever stage that they're on in, in their court. But he says, like, this is, this is important. They put your stuff aside. We got to pray for this man. You know, tell you lucky that in those 20 years, bro, for this bus full of black men, Dehumanize me.
not only was it moving, bro, but I, it, it felt like I was like in a slave ship, man. I felt like, what, what the hell is going on? These men's bodies were confined, and I was there amongst them. And they were in, in their own problems, but they had time to acknowledge that I, what, I had, what I had been going through and that I deserve some, some love. Amen. Amen to them. Shout to them, brothers. Yeah, dude. Shout to them, brothers. Whew. Anyway, bro. So back, back to, uh, back to the court, man. So, you know the the DA's, the DA's uh, Brent Ferreira, who was the top guy there, bro. He was, um, he was uh, the top district attorney at the time. Him and Juan Mejia. Uh, Brent just recently passed away, bro. And so Juan, Juan and, and Brent were there, and they're the ones who were who were assigned the case. They were the ones who were the, doing the prosecution side, and they knew they they had already once attempted to free me collectively, and they so they knew this is all just show because the sheriffs were just pushing them to do this. Basically, let let the judge decide. Don't don't try to let this guy out without fighting for it. And so the judges, you know, there we were, right. And so, uh, you know, to Brent's credit, man, Brent Ferreira, he, at the end, after, you know, attempting to put a, a, a good argument against me, he just turned to the judge and just said, like, look, it's, it's my ethical duty um, to do the right thing, and I believe that Frankie Creo should be freed. Um, Damn. This is the DA you're talking about. This is the DA, bro. <sighs> my ethical duty. Hmm. What's his name again? Brentford Ferreira. It's trippy, bro. I, um, you know, I, I think I've been, I've been, I've been doing things in my life, bro, since since I feel, it feels like forever now that I'm, I'm in places I don't belong, and I'm, bef I befriend people that the world says I shouldn't. Like this guy, Brent Ferreira. You know, this guy. After I got out, you know, we broke bread, and up until the the, the, the week he died, bro, I was by his bedside. You know, and um. You know, there's a. You know, we really have to analyze who we who we who we distance ourselves from, or who we allow others to say you can't be doing this or that, or they're they're um, unworthy of your time, or they'll never be your friends, or they'll never see you as a human being. And you know, luckily for me, bro, I can I can share with you that this man was uh, was a, was a friend to me. As bizarre as that sounds, bro. This dude became a friend, and when I when I went to his bedside when he was dying, you know, his daughter called me, bro. He said, hey, Frankie, like if, you know, she actually sent me a text message, like, you know, it's either now or never. Like, Pops is, he's on his way out. Like, he hasn't been moving for, he hasn't, he hasn't, uh, he's been sleeping for a couple of days, so he's probably, a, he's, but he's still breathing. And I show up to his bedside, bro, and not the man that I knew, he was super skinny. And, um. I'm just saying thank you to him and hey Brent, you know I'm just just stalking, bro, thinking maybe you know you hear those stories that maybe they can hear you, and he starts moving. And I'm like, oh, I start, I kind of panic, you know, I'm like damn. And uh, he says, about fucking time you show up, and I start laughing, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> It's about time you show him. And the wife, the wife, the wife, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what the hell is going on, bro. I tell the wife, hey, uh, Brent, Shit. Brent's, uh, Brent's moving, basically. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I don't know if he's rolling in his grave or if he's. Really... <clears throat> so oh. they come, bro, and he's like, I need water, I need water, bro. And he starts, you know, we get him water, and the vato, he was, he was, they, they were more surprised than I was, bro, that he, that he came back, you know. And um, I don't. I used to smoke cigarettes when I was a kid, bro, and throughout my life. But he smoked his whole life, and he wanted to smoke a cigarette, bro, really bad. You know, he's like, and so I'm like, yeah, man. So I, we we lit one up right there on his on his on his bed, and and he started making a bunch of phone calls, and you know, hey, I'm here with Frankie, I'm doing good, and so and so. Oh, he on. woke up to that, dude, bro. What it was, the? yeah. Oh. You know, lucky it was. It was smoked a cigarette and started making. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he, he was working with uh, Steve Cooley was his partner after he had retired from the DA's office. And, 
and he he started calling he started calling his partners from the firm and all you know he's just but what, what was trippy bro and I and I, I needed to um, I kind of regret it now but it, he wanted to shave he wanted to clean up for me he wanted he was kind of he felt his on his face and he was all kind of scuffy he's like oh I need to shave man and so you know they got the the razor for him he wanted to clean up bro and and, and then he says he didn't have any clothes on but he had like a like a towel over his over his privates and he said get me dressed and I'm like right like I can't get you dressed man he's like, no, no no like get me dressed man so he tells me where to go in his room and I put his underwear on bro and his pants and his shirt and his wife walks in and she's like what are you doing I go I'm getting Brent dressed he wants to go out he wants to go for a drive and she's like oh fuck dude like what are you like and then they kind of freak I'm trying to I'm giving this guy the last ride of his life dude he's He's back, you know, and 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 she I, and I get it, bro. Like I'm not blaming her, but she's like, Frankie, he's, it's not gonna like you can't get him in the car, and so so I you know, I respected her, bro, basically, and I just like okay, like you know, Brent, I don't think it's a good idea. Maybe you should just make some phone calls or spend some time with your wife, whatever. And so, but it was it was cool that he was just like he was back, man. He wanted to go for he wanted to hang, you know. His homie was there. He wanted. To, he wanted to go for a drive. <laughs> it's wow. a trippy experience, man. What a trippy. fucking life, <laughs> life, baby. Appreciate it while you got it, man. You're when they when they when they exonerate you. Um, when the judge resentences you, right? It's a resentence. The case is, has been has been uh, vacated. Is what they say. Like it, it's like as if it never happened. <sighs> pending, pending. In case they want to retry me again. But where, where, where do you where do you where do where do you go? What are you thinking? Like you know what I mean? Is is the, the does the handcuffs come off right away? Like what is the what is the what happens? You know, bro. It's it's um, because there was still a potential hearing left to see if they wanted to retry me. It happens in all the cases. The judge wanted to know where I was going to be. And so right there in open court, the next thing was, well, where will you be living? And I said, I, don't, I have nowhere to live. I'm, I have, I'm homeless. I've been, you know, like, why, why retell the story, right? I've been away for 20 years since I was 16 years old. My only caregiver is now dead. I have, I have nowhere to go. And so luckily for me, one of my attorneys who was here in the, in the room, Scott Wood, he's, he raised his hand, bro, and said, he can come live with me. <sighs> <laughs> Oh my God! That's big, bro. That's big. Huge. Huge. Do you walk out from that courtroom then and there? No, I wish, man. I I went you, back because you long. said they had a. They still there was a time if they wanted to pick it back up. How long until you released from there? So that was March fourteenth, the day I heard the judge say, you know, you're free to go. So they sent me back that night on the last bus. I went back to the county jail, and it took the sheriffs two days to process me out. And what do you do in those two days in that cell? You know, bro, I was... Um, are you punching the air? Are you fucking giving yourself high fives? I mean, you're in high power, right? Yeah, you know, bro... Your one-man cell? Yep, one-man cell. I think what happened was that I, I started... These, there were the, 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 the longest two days of those 20 years. And I was, I, I was debating if what I heard was correct. Because I'm thinking, shit, it's been two days. Like, what, what am I still doing here? Yeah. You know, and... And so um, eventually they come and get me and they take me to basically R&R. &R. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it, I get there and it's just like their last jab, dude, sheriffs. I get there and there's like five of them waiting for me. One's escorting me or two are escorting me and they hand me over to that last little group of, of sheriffs. And the dude has a rhinestone jacket, bro. Like just like I don't know who wore it or where they got it from, but they're like, "Here you go, put this on, and here are these pants." And I'm like, "I'm not gonna put that on." He says, "Well, if you want to get out, you gotta put some clothes on. You can't go out with that with that with the blues on." And I go, "Ah, oh, man, I'm, I'm like, fuck that. I'm not gonna fucking. Put. They're trying to clown me, dude. Ryan Stone jacket. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? They're fucking the trying to." They had, a, wow. they had a fucking big old box of just like random clothes for a moment like that, right? Like you don't have any clothes to walk out with. They're clown just, suits. They're trying to clown me, bro. And I'm like, nah, fuck that, man. I'm not going to put shit on, you know? 
And like, well, you know, like all that. Well, if you want to get out, you know, all you that. You got to put this clown suit on. And I'm just, here we go, dude. Even at the fucking door, man, <laughs> you got to work that. And I think the guys, the guys who were with me, the dude who, um, who escorted me was an older guy. He said, I'll go back in that, in that box, whatever they had. I'll find you something. And so they didn't, they didn't interfere with that. So he found me some like La Tigra or some shirt, some polo shirt and some pants and walked out, bro. <sighs> Frankie Carrillo, baby. Free man. Woo. You walk out L.A. County? L.A. County Jail, You yep. walk out and what do you do? I mean, what is it? What is the feeling, bro? I mean, 20 you know, bro, years away, dog. Yeah, you know what? It was, uh, it was a TMZ moment, bro. You know, I, I walk out. My first moment was, you know, cameras rushing towards me. Was it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was, I was um, you know, attorneys, family were there. They, they weren't really sure when I was going to get out, but they, I think at this point they had a good indicator. So media was there, uh, attorney, my team was there, my family was there. <laughs> and, um, you know, went through the motions of, you know, answering questions with the, with the media, big hugs and so on. And then from there we went to Echo Park um, to one of my attorney's daughter's pad where we had like a, a nice lunch, for my first my first meal and... And uh, it was it was like the spot where like other media that didn't make it for the first round could meet us there, that kind of stuff for interviews. But it was, you know, I, I can remember thinking, and they, I'm cool, they, I'm, glad, I'm glad they captured it on film too, bro. It was like, I looked up like, damn, <laughs> this is, this is <laughs> it, you know? Yeah. It was a beautiful day, man. It was like, you know, whatever that number is for weather-wise and the sun was bright. It's perfect. It's perfect. Man. Perfect day to perfect. get out. Perfect, man. Frankie, you know what I want to do, Frankie? Brother. Amazing, bro. Amazing. Uh, your resilience, your story, your just, just the, your fight, bro, for your freedom. Your journey, man, is just like, fuck, dog. They, they, yeah, they did a Netflix series with you. You need to do that movie already. Don't play with that shit, dog. You know what's, you know what's trippy, bro, was that I remember, they asked me a bunch of stuff, but what I remember, bro, was that some reporters put a microphone in my mouth and said, at what level of anger are you living in? At what level of anger are you existing in? Or something, something to that effect, right? And, you know, I said, I said something like, you know, I'm free now. I don't need to carry that anymore. But yeah. for those of you who are watching, for those of you who are paying attention right now, you should be angry over what happened. I don't need to carry that anymore. I want to be free. Yeah, Amen. and I'm grateful, bro, that that was my natural response to an unscripted question about at what at what level of anger are you existing in? You know? yeah. and, and you know, yeah, bro, I went through all the emotional roller coasters that we've been on multiple times. But at that moment, I was just grateful that 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 what that boy was expecting 20 years prior was to be taken serious, was to be valued, was to be. Um, given all the rights to all those laws that were supposed to be there to protect me. You know, it took 20 years, bro, but I finally got it, you know. Amen, brother. I want to open up the phone calls. Can we do phone calls? Of course. Open up phone calls. And uh, then get into the rest. Yeah, and then we'll get into the rest. But sure. I, I want to open up phone calls because I think it's important, dog. And I got to I gotta pee you gotta again. You to the bathroom? But let me, yeah, I, I'm sorry. It ran through me, dog. All right, I got, let me see. I got, I got some more. You have an idea? Yeah. Frankie, through all this, I mean, this is my question yeah, to you. What are your thoughts on the mechanism we call manifestation? I'm a big believer in manifestation. I've been a big believer that if you can see it, it, it can happen. You know, I've I, um, absorbed a lot of ancient and uh, repurposed knowledge from folks, stuff that I read or stuff that I heard. And, you know, back to Tony Carter, this woman that I'm giving a lot of credit to for being the catalyst of getting me out. You know, she was like the she was like the Folsom Prison Oprah Winfrey. She had all the quotes, she had all the books, she had all the all the insight, and so, you know, I guess my my um, my proof of that is that when I came home, it wasn't about I'm shocked, wow, I'm out. It was like more about it's about time. Like I, I it wasn't I was not surprised. This was supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's so crazy, bro. That's. That story, I mean, I've watched, like, I watched it all and watched some of your interviews, and every time it's just, and then you coming in here in person, I'm like, oh, shit, like, it was just, it was just surreal. Yeah, the story <laughs> continues, man, but. Man. What do you think was the greatest lesson you learned in the 20 years? 
You know, I think it's one of the lessons that I'm 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 trying to. Uh, I'll preface it by saying this. I remember when I was. There's a lot of Folsom references here, but it's another moment in Folsom. Well, I remember the the veteranos had been had been sort of checked out on the yard. At least at least visually, they weren't they weren't. Um, what I thought was that they were doing a disservice and not passing down um, the schooling to the younger guys. I remember thinking or hearing them say, "Yeah, they don't they don't care about us. They're into rap music, or they're they're, they're they don't they don't value what we have to say." So I'm not even going to try to say anything. Was right. that kind of there the, was there um, was there um, you know excuse I suppose right? But I think that you know one of the things I learned was that. In a, in a, now I'm referencing my my life as a whole, is that we need a we need to make sure that we instill in each other at whatever age, but especially in our youth, that you have to find your voice and be and empowered and allow yourself to be empowered by it, and for for the good um, as you move forward in your life. But if you're ever in a situation that I was in, you can't be afraid to to shine. You know, you're in a room where where you the last thing who should be shining is you because you're a defendant, um, and so you you sink into a place that doesn't that doesn't serve you any, it doesn't serve you well, obviously, and it's not about arrogance; it's more about like knowing that that you have value, and I think that the lesson that I one of the lessons that you know when I'm kind of going off the cuff here as a, as one that matters a lot to me, is that we all have value, we all have to think take ourselves seriously, and we have to instill that in other people as well. By the way, we live as as ambassadors of change, or as ambassadors of just like, hey, we, I realize we don't, life is short, and you know I want people who are around me to also be on that frequency as well. Mm, that's amazing. You, the bathroom's open. You can use the bathroom. Yeah, okay. use the bathroom, yes. Frankie. And we're gonna open up these phone lines right now. And they're already blowing me up, bro. Jojo from Puente, you just called in, bro. You know what I mean? Call back right now when Frankie's done using the restroom, bro. Oh, Sarafin. Let me see. Sarafin. Sarafin, what up, Dougie? What's up, Lucky? Are, are the airways open already? They are open, but Frankie just stepped away to go uh, use the restroom real quick, and he'll be back like within seconds, brother. How are you doing, Dougie? I'm doing great. I'm enjoying this interview, man. Great interview right there. Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to comment because uh, uh, Frankie and I, that's my brother right there, man. And, you know, he helped me out uh, after he got out. He, he was able to help me out, connect me with uh, Loyola Law School. And um, so I wasn't, you know, I think when I went, uh, I had my interview with you, I I told you that I was also uh, in prison for a crime I didn't commit, but I wasn't as fortunate as uh, lucky uh, to be exonerated. Uh that's Frankie. Uh, excuse me, uh, Frankie, uh, to be exonerated. Um, so, but anyway, he connected me with Loyola Law School, and they tried to uh, get me back in court. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't successful at it, but as I was starting to go before the parole board, they represented me at the parole board hearings. And, and uh, you know, after five uh, parole board hearings, I was able to get out uh, with their help. And, and now, uh, you know, you already know what I'm doing. I'm working with ARC. Shout out to ARC, uh, baby. ARC. Yes, sir. Shout out to Caesar from ARC. I love you, dog. You holler at me, dog. Let's get let's get reconnected, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about going back over there, uh, giving you an update on uh, what I've been doing. Uh, so we'll get that we'll get that going. We'll Serafine right here. Serafine, my brother, how you doing? I, I'm doing good, man. I enjoyed the interview. Uh, Great interview right there, Frankie. Uh, we got to reconnect out there. Hey, we, my dad wants to go make a little over there at the rancho, man. Br- bring him down, <laughs> but let's make it happen, bro. It's a little cold right now, right. but when, when the weather gets better, man, I'd love to you guys uh, to come out there. We'll invite Lucky, too. Oh, Absolutely, God. brother. We'll, we'll, well, I got some hogs I want to I want to, I want to butcher, bro, so maybe it can all work out. Is know? that something you're doing? A yeah. ran- you got a ranch? I got a ranch, yeah. And, and, you, and you're yeah. you're making the carnitas or what? You know, bro, I, I you know, I'm... I, I'm, I'm Humbled and honored, bro, that I can, you know, home is, is Echo Park, but I got a pad in uh, in the northern part. It's in the Lake Hughes area of LA County. It's a beautiful 30-acre horse ranch with, um, you, you know, it's, ho- it's, it's, Bro, it's, do you have horses? Yeah, I, I gave them away, bro. I had horses. I've had horses. I've had a, 20 horses on the property at times. I've had, you know, 20 goats, a bunch of pigs, roosters, chickens, tortoises. 
um, one too many dogs, bro. But it's it's a beautiful place. I would love to have you guys out there, man. Bro, my girls. In the handball court. In the handball court. Oh, yeah, yeah. handball court. In the handball court. Yeah. Oh, baby. Damn, <laughs> dog. Can the whole crew come, bro? Of course, brother. Yeah. Oh, dog. We would love and out my 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 wifey, my girl, my little ones, bro. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, they would love, bro. You let me know anytime. Let's make it happen, Serafin. Yes. Yeah, we'll make it happen. Saludos to your family, brother. I know your your family was with you throughout your experience, man, and you you've been a, a great inspiration. And, and I love the work that you're doing now that you're out, man, because you're being an ambassador, and you're being an example for folks that are that are watching, man. So thank you, bro, for all that you're doing. Absolutely, man. Best wishes to you both, uh, Lucky and, and Frankie and the Goonies. Uh, Yes, sir. Love, brother, love. You, let's brother. let's get Jojo. We got Jojo from Puente right here. Uh, Jojo, what up, doggy? Hello. Hold on. I ain't gonna take no phone call until I take Jojo's. Hold on. That's right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let me. I'm gonna call. I'm just gonna call him back because they just got. Uh, there we go. What's that beeping? Is that like the prison? Oh shit. Uh, uh, uh. Dude, these calls are coming in crazy style, bro. Like, everybody wants to holler at you, don't you? Did you know Greñas when you were in Boston? Who, homito? Um, Greñas on Thursday. Of course, brother. He's, he was a really good friend of mine. Yeah. Okay. You know, how do you know him? From old Boston? Oh, you okay? Yeah, yeah. I heard he passed away, man. Yeah. <sighs> Fuck. Yeah, you got, got the chance to get out, bro? He did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, Greñas is a really good friend of mine. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking about him on the way here. Okay. So funny you bring him up. Oh, my God. When were you there? Jojo. Oh, that's when I came out. That's when I got out, but yeah. Before I turned into Hello? Like, back into like a two yard. It was a three yard when I was yeah. when I left it. Yeah. Is he there? Jojo. Hello. Yo, Jojo, is this you? Yeah, what's up, Lucky? What's up, my boy? Hey, man, just wanted to call in and give props to, uh, hey, Happy New Year's, man, to you and the whole crew at Hustos and Goonie. Yes, sir, Jojo. Happy New Year. Happy New, Happy New Year, Year, brother. Man. Thank you, Don. Hey, brother, I just wanted to give Frankie much props, man. Me and him go back to uh, to YTS Day, Donovan Day, close being Donovan. <laughs> and, uh, hey, Frankie, man, you're an inspiration, brother. I'm very proud of you, man. Keep up the good work and, um, Hey, bro, you got me in a little trouble with the wife right now, though. <laughs> Usually it's me. How did Frankie get you in trouble, bro? Frankie got me in trouble when you was talking about that uh, Catholic chapel in YTS. <laughs> uh, you know what's because, up, Jojo. Because she, knows, she knew that I was always at the, at the Protestant chapel. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, was that going on in the Protestant chapel, too? I said, no, nah, that wasn't going on on our side. <laughs> It's, you know, bro, it's it's good to hear your voice, Jojo. I, you and I have, I think even maybe Juvenile Hall, man, but for sure YTS. And um, always admire you, man, and your journey. And so nice to see that you're connected with your family and, and, and your children. And I'm just grateful, bro, that you're home too, man. Hey, brother, man. Uh, hey, for what it is, man, I just want you to know that, um, hey, none of this happened by coincidence, brother. You know, God had a divine plan and purpose for your life, brother. I said... I look at that like this, brother, since me and you, we have the same story being tried as an adult, going through that crazy system. You know, I was guilty of mine, though. I was ready to do, you know, the rest of my life in there for, you know, uh, the bad that I did, brother. And, I, you know, it sucks that you had to go through what you went through. But you know what? I know through all of it, it made you a better man. I believe God preserved you like he preserved me. And it's our time now, brother. You know, it's our time now to be that father, be that person in the community that unfortunately we weren't um able to be at that young age but you know what I, i'll tell you this frankie the best is still yet to come for your life thank you jojo i appreciate that brother we ain't even got him to right. what he's doing now dog. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, this dude is a beast hey, jojo, jojo love you baby yeah. let's love get you, you back love on you too, let's man. get you back on in the next couple months how about that all right brother yeah we got i got some stuff going on brother it's, it's gonna be a home run man you gotta and we'll talk, we'll talk, brother. But God bless you guys. God bless, God bless you, you too. Say less, my G. Uh, let's get to the next phone call. You're on Hoodstocks. Talk to us. Yeah, what up, man? This is Jesse James from Linwood, brother. Linwood in the casa. Jesse James. All right, talk to us, dog. What up? Yeah, you already know, Frank. You know what's up, man? To you, brother. You just know who I am. Nice to hear your voice, brother. 
Oh man, I'm gonna tell you, man. I don't. I, hey, breaking story inspired into all of us, bro. Especially my brother has been down from the same. My big brother's been down. Similar crisis. Is that um? It's Frankie right there, man. Crooked cop, all kind of stuff, bro. And uh, I don't know if, if I want to call Frankie Batman, you know, or Jesus to us, brother. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that, man. Wait, wait, hold on a second. You don't know if you should call him Batman or Jesus? What the fuck you just say, dog? <laughs> oh, he's about to be Batman. Hey, hey, come on, homie. Hey, who, who, who's the biggest, who's the best detective in the world, homie? Who's the best what? Detective Batman. Is he the Batman <laughs> or Jesus Christ, brother? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, that's right, bro. I'll take them both, man. Hey, I'll wear a right. cape some days and uh, some chunk clouds another day, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Appreciate shout you, brother. Out, hey, Linwood, baby, don't That's play right. with it, dog. No, he goes, hey, Frankie, I'll get at you, brother. All right, brother. Stay strong, man. Thank Look. you for calling. You're on Hoodstocks. Talk to us. Hey, what's up, Lucky? What's up? Who is this? Esmeralda? <laughs> Esmeralda? What the hell is Esmeralda? <laughs> it's your twin brother. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know I have a twin? <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. What's up, love? How you doing? I appreciate you. You know, you a G. You a real G. And shout out to your dude for letting you always call in and talk to me. You know what I mean? You well, know, he no, either hates it or me. loves it. I'm sure he hates no, it. No, he's texting me. He's like, are you trying to call in? I'm like, yes, but I can't get through. <laughs> what is he? Is he texting you from his bedroom in your house? <laughs> No, he's at work. <laughs> oh, he's at work. Because that's a new thing. I think Jen uh, Jennifer Aniston is trying to start a new thing that says that it's okay. If you live in a household with your dude, it's okay for a female and a dude to have their own rooms. I don't get that. But anyways. That's why um, she's still single. That's, that's <laughs> crazy. That's why she's still single. Huh? Uh, well, we love you. You know what? You're the only female that calls in, takes my shit. I, I know, I think last time you called, I was talking some wild shit. I you apologize. You did, you did. You were like, I, I, I you were like, Dude. you were like, they blew your, they blew your shit out. <laughs> like a wild your lucky shit your shit They got the Grand Canyon down there, huh? You know what I mean? Your shit is, how many kids you got, girl? How many kids you got? I, well, I was about to say case No, because closed. I don't want to get I don't want to get into it. I yeah, have I get it. Okay, I had three of my own children. My first daughter passed away and then sorry, I did man. a surrogacy for my last pregnancy. So. Okay, okay, okay. Long hey, story short. Well you know what enough of all that. Thank you for always calling in. I mean, what did you think of uh this podcast, I mean. Oh this. my gosh, you know what? It was really good. And I want to watch the documentary because I didn't know who this person was and you posted like late about this. I did, for a so, reason. So, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, it breaks my heart to hear that he did 20 years for something that he was tried as an adult. Like, that's crazy to me. I, I really, my heart goes out to him. You Thank know you. what? Yeah, um, absolutely. And if you yeah. ever seen him in person, you accidentally tripped and f your face fell on his crotch. Um, <laughs> He's a married man, Lucky. <laughs> I'm just fucking <laughs> You know how we do it. Hey, I love you, girl. And you know what? You, you a G. Matter of fact, show me your address so I can send my cousin over there in a little fucking Chippendale outfit. You know what I mean? To hook you up. What's up, Nick? You got that done? No. <laughs> We're going to show up in a little motherfucking pop, pop, pop. I got you, girl. You hood stars, okay? Yeah, we'll pull up in uh, Casey's uh, elf outfit. Elf outfit, uh, give, me some that, give me some of that elf dick, girl. You like that? No. Oh, Lord. Uh, anyway, shout out to all the crazy goonies in the chat. The, and hey, my, my homie, Renee. He's always chopping it up with me. Absolutely. <laughs> we got a community right here, and we love you, girl. Thank you for calling in and always just being right. uh, just being a good sport about stuff. Thank you so much. You, yeah, and shout, yeah, no and, problem. And shout out to your dude. He's at work putting in the work for the family. No disrespect, Maji. You know how we do it. You put her onto this podcast. She told me. <laughs> hey, anyways, love you. Thank you, girl, for calling. Hey, right, you're on Hoodstocks. Talk to us. Yo, what's up, Lucky? Yes, sir. How you doing, Maji? Where you calling from? I'm calling from San Pedro. San Pedro, baby. Talk to us. I need to know. If the left side of your face was padded, would you be sitting on the other side of the table? <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> if the left side of your face was padded, would you be on the other side of the table? That's that's a good question, bro. That's a really <laughs> um, that's a mathematical that's question. That's a good question, man. That's a yeah, good question. Yeah, I mean, let me hear that. You lucky? Yeah. Oh, your ass, dude. Let's see it. You said lucky and got the other side. <laughs> Let's see it. 
Anyways, you know I'm a handsome Lucky man. My girl face, loves me. Just so you can sit on you know what? I just want to say shout out to my girl again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Lucky's I, in the doghouse. No, nah, sure. I ain't in the doghouse. <laughs> I just, I just realize, and I realize, and I realize, as men, we realize, and we realize, and we realize, because we just sometimes we're a little hard headed, and sometimes we need to realize and realize and realize how good we have it with our our people that uh behind us like our our women you know what i mean my girl you know what i mean i love you baby if you watch right now you get better love um hey so oh. f- yeah 100 <laughs> percent. no no real shit dog real no you shit. said she was like, sick right now no you said shit, she was sick dog. yeah she's not feeling Shout good right now. She, um, the flu is going around yeah, or they got some variants now new that variants been going everywhere big dog yeah yeah careful, where's it been going shit. droopy Everybody's been catching that yeah. shit, dog. For real, everybody's been sick, dog. That shit's been fucked up. Stop lying, droops. For real. Stop everybody's lying. Everybody's been sick. Are you gonna call, are you gonna call out tomorrow? <laughs> I was trying to call out on Friday. Dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, shit, I was trying to call out Friday, dog. No, I, I want to say this. Yes, I want to. I want to ask you this. I want to ask you this. And this is, what advice would you give my boy Droops right here? Um. He did. He sixteen years. He's been busted all his life. This dude's. He, this dude is a legend in my neighborhood, Northeast Los Angeles, Highland Park. He's a legend for being a legend in 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 the streets, mm. right? You know. And when we when we acquire a certain level of fame on the streets, a certain of respect. You know, and then we we get out after doing a long stretch from a Rico case. Right. You know, how can we still maintain our uh, like what, what 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 would you give to Rick to tell him so he can still re, re, re remain retain a status of an important person? What's the next level? Besides, he has a union job. He's do he's doing great, bro. You know, what I mean, like s- some of the homies have a hard time. And Rick, I'm sorry for putting you in the middle of this right good. now. It's all good. Yeah, I'm sorry for putting you in the middle of this, dog. But but Rick Rick is he's 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 one of our biggest podcasts. Any of last year? Did you watch any of this? I did. I did. Yep. Okay. Great and, show. Yeah. And 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 appreciate so you, appreciate you. And and so how? What advice would you give? These 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 fucking dudes that have been in the streets and have, have held the crown, right? Like, and, and so sometimes when you hold the crown for so many years, but now you're out, you know, and and you still want to hold your crown. Do you, you get mm-hmm. what I'm saying, bro? Like, uh, 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 uh fuck, I, I'm losing words right now. But what is the next step of? I got something for you, bro. I think, sure. I, I think I know where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, it's a two it's a two part it's a two part response. But I, I think I think number one is is uh, for you, Rick, and everybody else who's done time. Jump change, but in your case, sixteen years and everything in between, or even beyond that, right? Is that I think what happens to us, and it happened to me as well. So I'm speaking from experience. Is that we we come home and somehow magically we forget the lessons and the wisdom and the dreams and the self-talk that we were doing on the inside and we kind of we kind of not all it's not, but I'm kind of generalizing for this response we 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 purposely forget or we water down all that we've acquired and I think what we acquired when it comes to this thing that I'm talking about, this self-worth, this this wealth of knowledge, we're now in a world where you can't really reference that. There's no diploma giving you credit for what you've ob- obtained. So we kind of almost like start, we, we forget about it or we don't apply it. I think that's one that's that's really... Are we, are we miss, we miss the lack of attention that we have gotten in the past and we, and we need uh, our ego and I'm not, I'll speak in general, not necessarily him, but sometimes we need our ego of who we were then to now still like fueled a little bit. I, th- you know, I, I think what I said initially was just like a general, my, my little preface. I'm going to open up by saying that we should, we should be, we should return like a, like a, like the, the, the well-balanced human beings that for those who are lucky enough to come home with some understanding about society, yourself, others, 
we should we should hold that and, and nurture that, you know, expand on it when you get out. But I think to your point about Rick, I th- I think I'm kind of just shooting off the cuff here, but I'll I'll tell you what might apply. Is that when you're when you're in the head? I was talking to Casey, and he was asking me about some of the lessons on the inside. And I think what it, what happens is that, and I and I shared it with you as well. There's these there's these watershed moments, these these um, these stations in our life, where we can either stay complacent or we kick into another gear. And I think with all the the with 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 uh, Rick's resume of of um, of living two lives, the life on the inside, life on the outside, and, and, and being successful on both. And how do you come out now and how do you mesh that and use it to your advantage? And then of course, how do you apply that and and share it with the community, with your family, with the people around you? And so I think for me, I would use language like, Rick appears to be like, a, he still looks young. And maybe to me, he, might, he looks to be like, and he's like in his late 30s, maybe or mid 40s, maybe. Mid 40s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I'll, 46, bro, 46. There you go. But, yeah. I'll, but I'll, I'll tell you, bro, that this is for, uh, Lucky's the same age, I'll be 50 in March. Yeah. We have to, men of our age, we have to realize, bro, that we're now the, the young veterano. No. Or, the, or, or we're now someone that someone is looking, have been, in that position and we have to embrace that and not act like we're still 21 like no we have to own it and we have to behave and conduct ourselves in a certain way if we want change to happen and and, and how you will apply all that you all that you are rick and all that you can be and all that you've you've been and say like yeah i'm, I'm now this you know i'm now this elder in my community to a young guy you might be super you know a little bit you might think you're really old but for someone in their 20s, they might be like, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. And, and I see your crown around your neck, bro, and I respect you for being able to, to um, you know, maneuver through those worlds. But I think, I think you're, if I would be so inclined and you'd be so open to give you some advice, bro, is that, um, as one of the callers said, Jojo said, bro, like, for someone like you and all of us here, bro, not just us, but I'm focusing on you. Yeah. That like the, the best is yet to come as well, bro. No, of course. Let's I've been go. out here I've been out here trying to do it, like uh real shit. Like my kids I got out to my kids like in their twenties, you know. I went in when they were in their early, like, you know, lower I went to jail, my daughter was one, my other daughter was four, my other daughter was ten. So, you know, I did sixteen, so you come out to like some adult kids and and just trying to maneuver and like um, before that all I did is really like be in the streets, you know. So like now I came out to like um, working. I got a good union job, you know. What are you working for? I work for OHL. I work on the five freeway. I nice. do um, construction on the freeway. Nice, bro. But I'm a journeyman three, so like I'm I'm straight. Like I make good money. Like my kids are, um, they got good like medical, the insurance. Going to college. Yeah, it's my amazing, kids, you know, yeah. college, they're doing good. So, you know, everybody's working, everybody's good. So like the whole thing, like, I think what Lucky was like kind of getting at was like, like people are really known or are used to me being out here, being in the streets type deal. Mm. So like when I'm out here working and doing my thing, like, you know, it's just um, tough sometimes dealing with, I guess, with the both worlds as far as, um, um, like, what, like, life. You know what I'm saying? Like, the way the way it goes, you know, because, like, no matter what, like, they see me tatted up. They see me, you know, they But, see, you know, Rick, let me, let me, let me, I think, I think I, forgive me for not maybe picking up on this okay. earlier, bro, but, you know, I, I think, um, and I'll just say it, brother, you know, because it's it applies to you and a bunch of other people as well. Yeah. Is that you know, maybe you should you shouldn't be half stepping in one one world the other, bro. You can you can take off the hat and and be a full on um take on one role, you know, no, give that, well, give that an opportunity, bro, to see how that plays out. Because I think I think not to be not and forgive me if I'm yeah. stepping any boundaries, bro, but I think one of the things I remember when I was on the inside was that you know, you, you hear stories, you see it on TV, like, why are these dudes wearing T-shirts with, like, Bud Light? And why are they walking around with 
shower shoes or why like why are they walking around like in their in their like their like clothes that should be private like in their homes but they're just they've crossed that line and they're just don't care what they look like they're just moving around the world freely right yeah and I, and I've always wondered bro like I, I look forward to a time where men like us in this room say you know what I'm gonna put a nice shirt on today and I'm gonna, I'm gonna present myself to the world a little bit differently and let's just see what that looks like and be comfortable with who you are when you, when that is happening and then you know who knows what I don't know and not to say you know you the shirt you're wearing is something's wrong with them. I'm just saying, like, there's also a, a, a um, duality there with you that can be, at some point, it, it has to run its course. And not to say you have to hang up your hat, but yeah. maybe the crown gets passed down to somebody else, brother, you know? No, there's, Ooh, I mean, there there's, there's certainly people that <laughs> the crown got passed down to. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, they out there, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, real talk. Like, <laughs> look, at, look at me, like, <laughs> <real> Casey. Shit, <laughs> that was like, sure, like, baby. That's right, that's right, man. You, you know no, what? Like, you like, know one thing I love about Rick is, is so I've Rick Rick within my neighborhood. I've known Rick since we were kids, right? Mm -hmm. We're in our fucking mid forties, dude, and and we clicked since day one on some man, was some crazy shit, right? You know what I mean? Like Rick's a fucking Rick's a nut, and you know, you know, I was I was a young dude trying to catch up to what they had been doing since they were like nine, ten years old. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, real shit. You know what I mean? But you know, if you want to be first string, you know, what I mean, you're gonna step up and do what you gotta do. Um, but I, I I I I I advocate for Rick on a level that um, that I don't know. To, I don't know. I don't know who he's uh, like. What his uh, outside influences with his relationship outside relationships besides ours bro mm -hmm. but i know where he's come from he's a fucking baby kid i know his mom i know his whole family his brothers you know what i mean his sisters and um and 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 i and rick has always since day one been somebody that everybody loves I can see and that. He's been every we dude. Like I was always the bad guy. Rick was the good guy. You know what I mean? Like if he was running for mayor in the neighborhood, he would have fucking beat me by a fucking <laughs> landslide. You know what I mean? Like Rick has always been a very even killed, likable person where he doesn't give a lot of like you don't want to cross his bad side, but he, he in regards to the community. People have always held him up to just a, a certain level. So I've had conversations with Rick in the background. Sometimes I'll be, I'll be like, fool, you got to run for fucking do some type of thing within the community, oh, yeah. bro. A leadership type yep. of thing, you know what I mean? And so I, I will always be pushing for him on, on that level of existence within his uh, new coming chapters that we are always... You gotta talk, man. I need to motivate him, you know? Uh-huh, always. Well. I mean, you're doing it. So. Always, bro. Always, bro. You know what I mean? And that's that's just what I want to say with Rick. And I'm sorry, Don, for putting no, it's you... That's all good. That's all good. Yeah, you know, but he's I doing it though. He's like doing you know, it too. Yeah. He's making the steps. He's doing it, and the evolution of 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 uh, homies right within the neighborhoods um, that have made it through a dark past. Uh, fuck, I can't even say like yourself, but just a lot of individuals. You know what I mean, including yourself, right? You know what I mean uh, is is amazing. What What are you doing right now? Now that you're you're out, are you, what are you are you running for Congress? What is it? What is it you're doing? So I'm running for state assembly. And what, what exactly is that? So state assembly is basically like uh, the lower house of, of, uh, of the state legislators. So it's the Senate. So maybe I'll start from the top. So it's, it's the governor, the Senate, a body of senators. Underneath them would be the assembly members on a state level. And so there's, uh, so, so assembly, the assembly seat that I'm running for is um, the 52nd. So it's, Highland Park, it's Echo Park, head. it's uh, Los Feliz, Silver Lake, East LA, uh, parts of Glendale. Um, Our area. Yeah, that's it's where the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's, where we grew up. So I've been, you know, I've been, you know, so I, you know, I. That's what's happening today in my life, and you know, I wear many hats, but that's this is the most important hat. What right is now. the What is that? What power does that seat hold? So you're a lawmaker. So the the seat. The, the seat is is a legislator, a, a lawmaker, amongst all the other ones who are up there representing their districts. That it's a you know it's a um, it's a puzzle of all these different districts throughout um, California that make up assembly members, senators, and so on. And so that's the the power that 
that um I mean, there's many. There's a traditional way of thinking about it, like you you are running to be a legislator, a lawmaker. But in the, but in this this on this podcast, talking to you and in our audience, you know, I'm on the verge of making history. So, in the history of California, I would be the first formerly incarcerated person to go from the big house to the state house. And I think that where we are today in the evolution of just our societies, uh, us as how, we, how we've been viewed or are being viewed, to have someone like myself break that, break through or break in and be elected into the body that determines and is a, is a reflection of our, our community would be an amazing thing. <sighs> Let's go, baby. Let's go, dog. How do we support you? A couple of different ways. Oh, someone dropped some. A couple of different ways. So you know, obviously, campaigns you know are, are ran by more fundraising. So contributions is one. I can I can share my link about share it folks, all. Yeah, how folks can help out. So that's in in the contribution is you know hiring my team, uh, getting the message out. You know, uh, um, a number of things. You know, just digital ads and so on. So the idea is to excite the voter, let them know that I'm running. You know, people. There's a, there's a, a lot of folks who will ultimately. I'm like, I'm back in the jury, bro. The, there's gonna be a decision made about, do we elect this guy? It's no longer guilt or innocence. It's now about, do we do we support him? Do we like his ideas? Can we see someone with the story, lead us on this capacity? And and what kind of response are you getting within that community? Favorable. You know, it's and it's not it's not because I've it's because I've done the work. So there's a lot of parallels about, you know, doing the work or hustling or what have you been doing for the party or what have you been doing for the community as a whole. And, you know, that that starts from, you know, the day I came home. But we, we can go back there a little bit if you want. But Let's the main thing it. as of right I, I now. I'd like to go back to that because you went to, uh, I mean, what, 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 uh, what have you obtained since you've been home uh, education wise? So I, I got a, a BA, you know, I got a, I got a degree from LMU when I came home. So after after I, I was out for about three months, I um, the president at the time of at LMU, which is in Marina Del Rey, was a, a gentleman by the name of David Burcham. David Burcham used to be the the dean of the law school, and he was aware of my case because you know it's a legal case, and um, Scott Wood worked at the law school, so he was just aware of what was going on, and so. Um, I called, there was an appointment made with Maria, his secretary at the, at the university. And um, long story short, I went out there and, you know, um, made the pitch. The pitch was, you know, I'm home now. I've been home for three three months. Uh, one of my dreams has been to get an education. And now that I can do it, I want to be a student here. And he said, you know, he was, I think he was probably caught, caught off guard. Like, why would a guy who did 20 years now want to do four more years, basically, right? Yeah. And um, he says, hey, Maria, you call Joe, Joe Labrie. So Joe Labrie was his, the second in command at the university. And so Joe comes in and says, I want to introduce you to Frankie Carrillo. And he says, Frankie Carrillo, that sounds familiar. He says, oh, I know, I've, I've heard of you. He says, you know, I, I give mass at uh, my churches in Hancock Park. And just this past, this is a Monday, the day prior on Sunday, a woman on the way, she was leaving the uh exiting the, the mass, she told him, hey, did you hear about this guy who just who got out of prison? He's been exonerated. And so, you know, he said he hadn't heard of me, but there I was in, in his front of his face now the day after. So he wow. saw it very divine. Wow. Yeah. He saw it very like this is, uh, this is, you know. Meant to be type Meant of to thing. be, exactly. Yeah. So long story short, um, I took some, I basically became a full-time student after that. So. Soon after, I became a full-time student, and in four years, knocked that out. You know, and while that was going on, I was, you know, assimilating. I was, you know, trying to, you know, find my footing on the outside. And little by little, just people who were in these movements were asking me if I would get involved in issues that they were that they were concerned about. And one happened to be the death penalty. So I'm, I'm you know, anti-death penalty. At the time, they were trying to eradicate it and, you know, do away with it in California. And so. I became, you know, the the lead spokesman, the poster boy, I guess you can say, for those campaigns. And then, um, you know, members of the legislative body were asking me to testify for a number of bills. And I just got myself involved in just 
the movement. And it came very naturally because I felt that I had been advocating for such a long time for myself and other guys on the inside that that, that button had had broken. It was just on. It was just on. So it, it, it was what I had been doing for my, felt like my whole life. And so naturally getting involved was just something that I did. And um, it kind of went from there. Absolutely. And so, and I, I, you know what, this is a, this is a question that I, I mean, I kind of like personally wanted to ask you, you know. Um, so it, when you're wrongfully incarcerated, um, you can get X amount of money from that, right? You yep. know, and so how has that changed your life? And how did you learn financial literacy? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So what happens if when you're exonerated, the, the state of California offers you, at the time it was $100 a day. So you, you apply for it. And it was very hard to get back then, but I applied for it and I got it, which was roughly about $800,000. $800, and now it's up to 140. So if someone who's been exonerated now, the process is a lot easier to get, but it's also more money. But the, the more, the more um, what else happened besides going to school or getting involved is that I filed a, a civil rights lawsuit against the sheriff's department. So that's where, where we're talking about multi-million dollar if it, if it works out. And so, you know, my case uh, stems from childhood with these deputy gangs and then eventually they're involved in my case and then we prove it and so there's a moment of going to trial and you know, um, you know the, the, there might be a bigger payout or you settle there's a mediation process and you go through that and there's a, another amazing legal team who gets involved there and so I, at the time I settled for 10.1 million dollars which is the, at the time was the largest payout in US history wow it was a little bit over half a million dollars per year. And why was it uh, the, one of the biggest payouts in, in history at the time? Why, why? So, you know, it's interesting, Lucky. These, these cases are determined on sort of like what happened prior. So, you know, I can go in there and say, you know, I want $50 million. Like, that's my number. I, I suffered $50 million worth of suffering. That's what I want. And, you know, you, you can walk in with that attitude. But when you're at the table to mediate, to kind of broker a deal, they say, well, okay, Frankie, I get it. But just so you know, the last three cases of exonerations, this is what they got. And it's like, so you reference that. And, and, and um, to get to that point, there's a number of things that have to happen. So one of the things that happens is they do a vocational test on, on myself, which is a little weird, but they, it's basically is, if this would have never happened, what would have you become and what what type of earning would you would you have had? Wow, which is kind of like a, you know, fill in the blanks, right? Like what you know. So the 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 test determined that I would became I would have become a lawyer, and based on that, I would have had X amount of dollars up until twenty years of or whatever amount of working time. And then they so other other formulas, other calculations, but um, that's kind of it, it's it's an interesting dynamic, also about like. Uh, injury versus um, like pain and suffering. So like, hey, we get it, you were there, but like how can we prove that you suffered? And then that suffering has a number to it as well. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing, but that's just the way that the system works. So to Casey's question, financial literacy, how, how, how have, have you, I mean, obviously you're not a dumb dude, right? You know, um, how have you been able to uh, accumulate this money. I, I mean, I, we know how you accumulated the money, you know, um, but how have you been able to, uh, you know, maintain it and make the right decisions with the money? So, you know, I, I come from a family that, you know, didn't have wealth. So I'll start off by saying that, you know. And so I am now um, a multi million dollar, I'm a multi millionaire. And that comes with a lot of personal pressure, a lot of social pressure. But I, I knew that what I needed was a, a wealth manager, or a financial manager. And that's, that's what I'm gonna do with the money. Is the money just gonna sit there? I'm just gonna just, you hear these lottery stories where people get all this money and they blow it. Yeah. And so, that, you know, I, I didn't wanna, you know, I felt like where that money came from and what it symbolized for me was, was not throwaway money. It was not, 
let's go to Miami, money or whatever, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm I thrifty. You know, I'm a guy who still walks into a goodwill. Yes. You know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not embarrassed to say that, you know. Um, I also like to wear nice clothes or live comfortably, but, you know, I, I don't I don't think of money as, you know, I rarely even say I'm a multimillionaire. Like, I don't I don't use that language, but I want to make sure that this this wealth is is um, this wealth is is um, it's not only my wealth is also for my children and people in my lives. You know, so it's it's how to preserve it and how to maximize it. Like, you know, it's like here's an example of that is that I had never heard of compounded interest. And it's like, well, that sounds like something you would have learned at some point. But what it is is basically is that you have money that the, the money, um, um, there's interest that comes from that money that's being, that's being um, invested. And that money is compounded. It goes for like it feeds back into it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger if you do it correctly. It's one sort of basic way of, of, of sort of working your money, making your money work for you yeah. versus, versus not, right? Versus having it sit. Having it sit or just blowing it on, you know whatever you are blown it on you know so it's just trying to be smart be smart with your money yeah what's that book called good good uh rich dad poor dad or something? rich dad poor dad mm-hmm. i mean he talks about um i wish i've read that book he talks about uh making your money work for yourself i mean what was the first thing that you purchased when you uh received maybe your first uh deposit of lump sum of money because it's probably different Different yeah. deposits that you got, right? For different levels. Yeah, you know, I think symbolically, I, I, I bought a home. You bought a home. I bought a home in Echo Park. Yeah. Echo Park. How much yeah. did that home cost? I paid one point two five million cash. Cash. Yep. Cash. And what did they want for the home at the time? I think they wanted they wanted what I gave them. They wanted what yeah, you gave them. They, they weren't they budging, got. even if it was fucking in a suitcase, duffel bag, and a fucking a Honda Civic trunk. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> well, you know, may, I mean, maybe, right? You could have worked in, like... I would have I would have given more. Yeah. But I, I because I, you wanted that home. I wanted you know, bro, I used to walk I used to walk on the street and, and that that there was never the house was always well kept. No car in the driveway, no lights were ever on. And I just left a letter. I wrote I have a really nice penmanship as you can imagine from being in prison all those years. Yes, sir, don't and I wrote a nice letter and I was at the I was at the university, a couple maybe I don't know, some point after I wrote the letter, dropped in the mailbox, and I rarely pick up Unknown callers, and I really, I rarely pick up if I'm, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, I'm in the bathroom, bro, and I'm in the bathroom. The phone rings, and I'm like, I can't pick them. One, I'm in the bathroom. Two, I don't recognize the call. And I said, oh, what the hell? So I picked it up, and he says, Hey, I, I, my name is, you know, David, and you know, he went from there. Some older dude. He says, Oh, I loved your, my, my wife loved your letter or something about the letter. You know, is that, did you really write that? <laughs> I said, yeah. I, you know, I kind of caught me off guard, and I realized what it was about. He says, "Oh, you want to buy my house, huh?" I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I'd love you, you know. So he's like, "Y'all, let's meet up." So met up with the guy, and it turns out his father had been accused of being a communist back in the, you know, the Red Scare here, you know, hist- U.S. California history, where they thought that you know people were were disguising who they were, and they were working for. You know, foreign governments, and this dude who was just like a nerdy guy working. I don't think he was a teacher. Just he just he fit the the model that they had they had for these folks, and he had been imprisoned, and he wasn't he was not a he wasn't a spy. He wasn't a communist. But when I share my story with this guy David, the homeowner, he was really taken aback and saying like, "Man, this is a story that you know hits me really close." And my dad had been wrongfully accused as well. And I would have never thought that, you know, here's just this, this white guy from, from Echo Park. And to know his dad had been, you know, in a similar situation, you know, really moved him. He didn't, you know, he didn't give me the house. Obviously, he still sold it to me. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't, he, 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 could have, he could have gone on and maybe got more for it. But he said, you know what? You want to buy it, I'll sell it to you. And wow. is, is this the house that shows you, like, on the back porch mm-hmm. of the Netflix special? It's a great spot, bro. Yeah. Yeah, and you got a beautiful view right there, oh, man. man. Echo Park is beautiful, man. I, you know, it's it's uh, you know Joseph Campbell, one of the many books that you know that that float around in prison. Hero's journey, hero's journey, exactly. There's a there's a there's a passage in there where he starts describing um, Amazon indigenous Amazon mentality, where these folks are so used to you know um, myopic vision. Everything is like in the jungle. You know, everything's in your face. 
and they've never experienced like open open plateaus like vision like far away vision it's always like in your face trees and whatever and he says that when that person is allowed to experience distance like a view that it's like this the, the, what they've described or Joseph Campbell describes as this like this moment of like um, like pure ecstasy of like you you see the the the, the you see the uh, you see the importance of who you are and like where where you are in your surroundings and they made, he made it you know I'm doing a terrible job of explaining what he said but it was basically when you're able to have a view and, and experience and be able to see out into the distance it's it's uh it's something that helps you not only evolve but it, it helps your your conscious expand wow. and and then he went on from there right but um, so the home it's it's a great place for a guy who who was confined you know walls everywhere to now be in a place where you can look as far as you want to look (laughs) it's pretty cool amazing and so since you've been out and we we know that you've gone to school we know that you're in the political realm i mean you're you're advocating for all the right things that right here to hoodstocks believes in um how how have you have you solely lived on that uh, you talked about compound interest as well, but uh, have you had what what jobs have you had? So early on, I you know obviously these these political jobs that I that I was involved in, you know, paid my bills. These are these are jobs that um, yielded a salary, and they were they were not long time jobs. Campaigns over with, jobs over with, right? And what, what positions were you filling in these campaigns, political campaigns, correct? So the campaign was, I was, I was, I had agreed to be the lead in these campaigns. So I was the guy on the commercial. When there was big time meetings, when it came to fundraising, I was there in front of these big crowds, you know, getting people excited about the campaign. Um, but that was, that was great experience and it didn't, it wasn't necessarily there for a, a solid income. A lot of it relied on small jobs at the university when I was there full time, um, but the the they call it the forty nine hundred the money that comes from the state that came fairly quick. That came about maybe a year or so after I got out, so that was a pretty good lump sum to live off of. Okay, and, and you were so. and you're able to just uh, explore and experience different things basically. How, well, how do you see us? Uh, California, state of California is a power to reckon with and we get a lot of fucking hate from other states um, even though we just can't get enough people that are moving into the state Um, eh, but there's people that are moving out too let's let's be real about it you know, Uh, in regards and I hate to talk about this but I just this is my personal question that I would ask you even if we turn the camera off maybe be better like that but I'll ask you on live real time um, who's going to be our next president? Who would you like to see our, be our next president? You know, so I'm a Democrat. So yeah, I know that. So I'm I'm obviously going to support Biden. Okay. Do I wish that um, um, there was someone with with um, someone else in the ticket that I would support? Absolutely. But as of right now, you know, and I know Kennedy's running for um, as well. I like Kennedy. I'm not knocking him, bro. I don't. I, yeah. I think. I think. Um, so do I. I'm not. I'm not going to knock him. I like Kennedy, but I will say this, bro, is that when when um, before Biden won, I was on MSNBC and and they were saying I I was responding to a similar question about like we need stability. You know, Trump has taken the country in a way in a in a direction that I don't agree with, and I think that Biden, who's had a wealth of knowledge and experience. Can, can can be elected and can stabilize government. And then at that point, you've done your job, let somebody else kick in and, and, and replace you basically. But he's, he's, he, has, he hasn't decided to do that. He's decided to run again, which I wish that, you know, as a party, I'm not privy to those conversations obviously, but it would have been a great move to regain um, the presidency and then have someone there um, to then run after the four years are over, but that's not what's happening. I mean, Kennedy's not running to, you know, he's running on his own ticket, but he's, he's a Democrat as well. But that's what I would say. I mean, it, it, yeah. And, and I get it, I get it too, you know, and um, a person of your stature, uh, you know, rubbing shoulders and just the, just the levels that you're at, bro, I, I get it, you know, it's, it's, 
it's kind of rigid, right? You know what I mean? If you're Democrat, you're Democrat. If you're Republican, you're Republican. I mean, you got to stay, you got to stay with the team, even though if you feel that it's not necessarily the best choice moving forward, but if it's the only choice, I mean, I, 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 I get it, you know? I want to ask you this, though. I want to ask you this, and I, and I, <laughs> I hate to drag you through this, brother, but is uh, Israel uh, committing genocide? I think they are. You know, I've I've um, I've been to Palestine. I've been to Israel a number of times, and um, you know, I've, I've you know, I I see I see maybe I probably wouldn't start by saying genocide, but what they're doing is 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 inhumane, and maybe maybe I should say I agree it is genocide. Uh, and I'm not and I'm not saying for you to agree with it because my pops is a Jew, bro. My mom's Mexican. That's why you see this beautiful light skin right, right here. It's from the Jew side. My pops is a Russian Jew, bro. My pops is, he's an 80 year old man, very rigid on his stance. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, and But you know, we have uh, an audience right here, a uh, Latino audience that is, is, you know, if you believe it or not, I mean, it's a conservative audience, yeah. bro. We have a lot of Trump supporters right here. Yeah. Bro, I can you know, see that. Yeah, a absolutely. lot. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a, it's really interesting um, in the political realm of this dojo right here. You know, that, that there's so many conservatives, you know, that stand on the Trump side. You know, and and sometimes I get a little backlash. I don't like to really get involved too much in politics because I like to. I, I'm on a stance where I can I, vote. I can no, no. Can I vote. can <laughs> vote now. I can <laughs> vote now. I can <laughs> vote, and I have voted, bro. You know what I mean? But I, I like to. St I, I I feel like when it comes to politics, you know what I mean? If you do not have, uh, it's shit rolling downhill, and we are all at the bottom of the fucking hill, and these political leaders are laughing at us as we are tearing each other fucking apart arguing with each other, you know, all this fucking madness, you know, and it, it, it's, it, to me, it's just a fucking mess. So when it comes to politics, I control what I can control. And that's what's underneath my roof. You, you, you feel me? You. Like yeah. it, it is really, really tough. And I don't like so to my, get involved with a lot of this. My, stuff. Um, my, my, my young children are, are Jewish. Their mother is Jewish descent. And, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't conflict me when, when I see, when I, when you know, you have enough understanding of, of the conflict, and we all do, we can all, you know, absorb people's points of views or read about it or whatever. But when you when you see what's happening, it you know it, it definitely it definitely causes me to think of like, you know, here are people who are being oppressed. Here are yeah. people who are, who are there's a there's a power imbalance here. There are people who, and I'm looking maybe talking about the government. But regardless, you know, in separating the people from the government, but regardless, the, the people vote these people into, into, into power. So it's hard to completely separate the, separate the two. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, what is happening there is, is unjust. I think there's a lot of parallels that happen here or have happened here in the U.S. or California or L.A. about people who look like us, people who, you know, um, who treat us as, as we're, we don't belong here. And this is a lot of that sort of language there about um, we want you to you know be we're not we're not happy with you or what you're doing so we're going to treat you a certain way, and so, uh, but I'm with you I'm, I'm with I'm with this this issue about um, I believe what is happening and it's it's unjust. Yeah, I, I, and I and I and I and I and I agree with that too in regards to what's going on out there. Uh, you know, you have a ceasefire and all that. I mean, you don't want to see, bro, like what kind of person are you that want to see kids fucking die and this and that? It's, you know, it's, bro, it's, it's interesting too, forgive me for cutting you off, bro. You yeah. know, I, I, um, you know I, I've, been, I've been to Israel a number of, a number of times and I've, I've also been to Palestine. And, you know, I have, I have a friend who, who's from Ramallah and her, her family are doctors and she's an architect and, and there's life there. There's, there's, there's people, there's, there's, beauty that's happening there I think sometimes people get the misconception that 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 they're not they're not doing much of, of, of anything there but it's it's obviously wrong you know and I think that um, when there's a narrative who controls the narrative and who's who's more important or who's not um, we have to be we the the recipient of this stuff have to be very careful of, of um, 
what we believe, I suppose, right? And you know, when I was when I was down there, the last time I was down there, I was um, I was missing my, my my brown counterpart. I wanted to be around some brown people, bro. Yeah, just like that. Yeah. And I told my my then wife's uh, family, hey, I, you know, I want to go to Palestine. Don't don't do it. You shouldn't go. It's dangerous. Whatever. I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna go. And because I felt like I knew what that felt like. That's like, don't go to Linwood, don't go to Compton, don't go to Watts, don't go to South. Like, don't go over there. Yeah. I just felt like, oh man, like here we go again, right? And I went, bro. I got on that bus and I crossed that those prison walls that looked like a big towers there, the big wall, the big everything that I looked that felt very familiar to me. And I had a beautiful time there, bro. And I met some beautiful people there. And I I had this this newfound appreciation for things that I had learned in prison. That I hadn't I wasn't applying when I got out. I was, I was like, oh, I'll 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 accept somebody else's version of what I should be thinking. And that is that when I was when I arrived to here's a little story when I arrived to uh, a level four in Corcoran a buddy of mine that I knew from the streets said hey do up with that guy don't talk to him don't do that don't do this and I said I just came from YA and I said like why why are you like why isn't anybody taking care of that why are you telling me about it yeah and he's like oh like he wasn't expecting me to say that and I say all that to say, bro, is that like people are going to have their stance, their beliefs about what, where you should go and who you should hang around with. And I always felt like, let me make my own assessment of that. And, and I'm grateful that I can share the story about crossing into a space that, that embraced me. Yeah. I didn't feel foreign. I may have felt more foreign in Israel and Tel Aviv than I did. But there's Israelis that look like, look like me as well, so that's a misnomer as well. But I just felt very comfortable in a place where others said it was dangerous because that's that's where I've always been. You Absolutely. Know? And so to see people, young people, I'm, I'm a father, bro. I'm not going to be moved by, you know, um, seeing a father or, or another human being mourn for this tragedy. You know? Absolutely, brother. Hey, I want everybody to give it up for Frankie Carrillo, baby. Thank you, brother. That's been amazing, brother. Yeah. And once again, how can we support you? So we'll be having a new webpage, um, frankiecarrillo.com. I'm running for 8052. Uh, volunteer, there's, there's, a, there's a link there that you'll see how you can volunteer, host a party, a meet and greet, you know, contribution, a um, number of things that can happen there. But the idea is to <coughs> help, help dream with me, help this vision of a guy, as Jojo said, but there's still so much there to, be un to unfold and to do. And I'm, it's a movement, bro. At the end of the day, I'm just the messenger that we all belong, that we all uh, have value, and that there should be somebody with, the, with the, the, the life and lessons that I've obtained at that table, you know? And so I want to do the best that I can do, and um, I need everybody to help. And we're here to support you too, Thank brother. You. Thank you so much. We are out of here. Everybody give it up for Frankie Carrillo. Uh, support him in any way you can. Follow him on Instagram at... Frankie Carrillo Jr. Let's do it. Love Ooh, you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.